Okay, why don't we get started? Um, I'm John Haig. I am the um, co-director of the Mosavar Romani Center for Business and Government here at the uh, Kennedy School. I want to welcome everybody. Um, we have a few people here in person. Um, just so our panel knows, we have over 300 people online. Uh, so we have a large number of people who seem to have broad interest and have decided uh, they don't potentially want to expose themselves to COVID or whatever. I don't, I don't know the reason exactly. Um, um, I'm thrilled that, uh, to, that we are co-hosting the second installment of the 2023 merger guidelines uh, discussion workshop. Um, and we're doing that, just to be clear, with MIT Economics Department. Um, we're doing it with the Department of Justice and the FTC. I'd like to, in particular, thank the DOJ and the FTC for really bringing all of us together and, and kind of constructing and organize this whole discussion. Um, you know, the, the draft guidelines really fit well with the Center for Business and Government. Um, and they fit well because our mission, really our charter, which is not particularly narrow, is to re really think about issues at the intersection of business and government. Um, and this is clearly at the heart of many of those kinds of questions. Um, the role of business competition in American society is well known. Um, it has been in place for decades, uh, for centuries. Um, and in particular, I think the process by which companies merge um, and reshape themselves is a critical element of that process. Over the summer, the DOJ and the FTC jointly released the 2023 draft merger guidelines for public comment. Um, their release carries an important longstanding agency tradition of public publishing guidelines to help business, the public and the courts understand how antitrust enforcers uh, certainly assess the potential for a merger to harm competition or not. The most recent draft builds on decades of agency experience and expertise to reflect the significant evolution and advancements in the law, as well as fundamental changes in our economy and the nature of business activity. Uh, then anti antitrust enforcement, particularly merger review, reflects up-to-date legal and economic understanding and is essential to a well-functioning economy. Importantly, the agencies encouraged the public comments on the draft. Um, they have had over 3,000 comments, um, which is an interesting commentary that this actually is an incredibly important um, topic. Uh, and many of the comments on these uh, uh, guidelines are thoughtful. Uh, they're from knowledgeable people. Uh, and they really raise interesting and important questions about the purpose and the effect of some of these revisions. Um, today, we look forward to hearing from a number of the former enforcers, uh, academics, economists, practitioners regarding the key issues within the guidelines. Uh, I feel fortunate to have actually worked with this group. Even though I, I don't claim antitrust as my particular area of substantive expertise, uh, I am looking forward to learning huge amounts as I've already learned over lunch. Um, I would be remiss not to thank Nancy Rose. Uh, uh, Nancy is a Charles Kindleberger Professor of Applied Economics and former head of the economics department at MIT. Um, unfortunately, she um, really helped pull a lot of this together but couldn't join us today um, because of a death in her family. Uh, and she certainly is uh, sad that she can't be here. Um, uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce Dave Lawrence. Um, and just to be clear, Dave is the policy director of the United States Department of Justice of uh, DOJ's um, Antitrust Division. He's been there over 10 years, um, including as a trial attorney and counsel to the Assistant Attorney General. Uh, most recently, he has been a member of the team that has been drafting the guidelines. So he is intimately involved uh, in their development and in how they may be um, revised in light of some of the comments. So with that, I will hand it over to Dave. I want to thank all of you for being here, particularly all of you online. Um, we will try to make it as clear uh, and open and available to you as possible. One thing I would mention just for our panelists, as well as for the audience, uh, this isn't being recorded. This is being recorded and we will be posting it on both the MRCBG website, but also at the FTC and DOJ, I believe. Dave, all yours. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to everyone in the audience and, and those watching online. Uh, I'll just situate uh, this proceeding and the overall project for a few minutes. Uh, really wanna say thank you to the Harvard Kennedy School and MIT Department of Economics for partnering with DOJ and FTC to organize this today. I, I will say we've organized a number of these events over the years. Uh, and this is just about as smoothly as one has come together. So that's a real kudos to the team here uh, working with our team. Thank you for that. Um, I, I'm gonna offer uh, the special thanks to Nancy Rose uh, who couldn't be here today, but it's certain to say that we would not all be here today if she hadn't helped us conceive of and plan this event. Uh, I am doubly appreciative of Nancy because when I started 
uh, in the front office in 2016. She was leading economics at the antitrust division and wound up across the hall from me. Uh, and I learned a lot from her and from her predecessors over the years that's been very helpful in trying to engage with projects like this. Uh, one of the great things about working at the antitrust division as an attorney is the close work we do with the economists and how much we're able to learn from them. Uh, and you know, I was actually at the 50th anniversary of EAG a few weeks ago. Uh, we held an event in the Great Hall at Maine Justice, and a lot of formers came through and spoke. And you know, one of the common threads they all talked about was this incredible culture of collaboration, learning, debate within EAG at the Antitrust Division among the attorneys and and several of the formers spoke about how, as they've moved on in their careers, they've worked with smart groups of people, but never again with a culture like EAG and the way it works with the overall antitrust division to make us uh, better able to pursue our mission. And so I think about people like Nancy uh, as an example of how that culture was built and sustained over decades. Uh, and it's really in that spirit that we host this workshop, that we are moving through the comment process on the draft merger guidelines. Today is the second of three workshops that we're hosting. And the aim is to bring together experts, whether uh, supportive or critical of what we have in the draft to help debate issues as the drafting team works to make the final the best it can be. Uh, obviously, uh, many watching online have probably watched other panels. I think there are dozens of panels uh, about the merger guidelines and the drafting team has been participating, but one of the great things about these workshops, we get to turn the tables. So Aviv here is in the moderator chair this time and gets to be the one asking the questions. And I will say that that is incredibly helpful to us on the drafting team because we can sort of focus in on questions that as we're reading the comments, we really uh, wanna engage with the experts on. I think for those of you who saw the first workshop, it was already uh, successful in that regard. So for example, one of the common threads on both of the panels was panelists urging us to talk in different ways, but to talk more about market power and how it connects to the competition analysis. And I know that's something the drafting team has talked about, we're thinking really carefully about. And actually, if you saw Jonathan Cantor's remarks at Fordham just a couple of weeks ago, uh, he said, and I quote, the draft guidelines explain that competition plays out in many ways across the economy. We should use tools fit for purpose to identify mergers that might lessen it. But one thread, he says, carries through all the diverse competitive environments in our economy. When mergers lessen competition, they enable the exercise of market power that harms consumers, workers, and other market participants. Now, I can't tell you exactly how that concept or related concepts will show up in the final, but I think that's an example of how the debates we're having in these workshops is flowing right into thinking at the agencies. Uh, and I think we will see more of that today. So the first workshop focused on evolutions of the prior merger guidelines. So the horizontal theories and the vertical theories in some specificity. One of the things that's actually gotten, I think mostly surprisingly uh, for us, mostly positive feedback in the draft is that we now combine all of the types of theories of harm into a single document. So it's sort of a one-stop shop for thinking about mergers. And that was actually something in the RFI when we first did questions that was very hotly debated. And there are still people I think who don't like it and comments critical of it, um, but there's more of a consensus emerging that like in 68 and 82, we're better off with a single document. That raises a really hard drafting challenge though. What do you do with all of the shared analytical content that, that applies whatever theory of harm you're using, right? So in the 2020 vertical merger guidelines, if you look through them, there's just kind of this, this punt. So every once in a while, it'll say, on this concept, go see the 2010 horizontal merger guidelines, right? Um, so you know you're gonna need to have some cross-references in, in a document like this. And the way this document handles it is to collect those analytical tools uh, in a series of appendices, and then to have them sort of work across the prima facie case and, and the uh, rebuttals. One of the things we're gonna be talking about today is in the first panel is more on a practical level of how that analysis is gonna play out in real cases. So you know, one of the debates we're working through is how do you do that collection? How do you make it work 
in a broadly applicable way. And so we are so fortunate to have Aviv Nevo and a really talented panel uh, here that he will introduce. Second, uh, the second panel is gonna cover some of the newest material in the guidelines. So the platform section, and then how it interacts with other stuff. And you know, I mentioned earlier, like how much you learn is working with the uh, economists at the division. I have to say working on this section with Dr. Athey was one of the greatest learning experiences in my career. So she is one of the foremost experts on platform economics. We kind of had the task of putting in a like readable nutshell, a few pages of sort of shared taxonomy and key principles. And we've gotten a lot of comments on how we can do that better, but the process along the way, I personally have learned so much. And so you are all fortunate to have Dr. Athey uh, and a really talented panel coming up second, talking about those issues as well. Uh, before I conclude and pass it to you, I'll just give a pitch for our third and final workshop, which will be in Chicago at the University of Chicago on November 3rd. So mark your calendars for that. Uh, and with that, thank you to the panel and uh, we'll take it away. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Dave. Uh, my name is Aviv Navo. I'm a professor at Penn. I'm on leave from Penn and currently um, the director of the Bureau of Economics at the Federal Trade Commission. Um, before we start, I'd just like to echo some of the things that uh, Dave mentioned. I'd like to thank the Kennedy School and the MIT Department of Economics, uh, John and Nancy personally for really hosting us and allowing us to be here. Uh, it's a real privilege. So we have a great panel today. So let me start with um, introductions. So first kind of uh, immediate uh, to my right is Limor Daphne, who's the Bruce V. Professor of Business Administration at Harvard Business School and professor of public policy at Kennedy School. In 2012 and 2013, she was uh, the deputy director for healthcare and antitrust in the Bureau of Economics at the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, professor Daphne's research examines competition in health and the intersection uh, of business strategy and public policy. And we're very glad to have her here um, today. Uh, right, um, uh, right next to her is uh, Marty Gaynor, uh, who's the E.J. Uh, Barron, uh, University Professor of Economics and Public Policy at Carnegie Mellon University and former director of the Bureau of Economics at the U.S. Federal Trade Commission. Uh, as you can see, my main challenge here is just to get through all the titles. <laughs> you know, maybe next time we should get people who are not quite a senior. Hey, but, if we're running out of time. <laughs> exactly. Sorry. <It's, laughs> you're going to be demoted. Um, uh, Professor Gaynor's research focuses on competition and incentives in healthcare and on antitrust policy. Uh, next to him is Louis Kaplo, who is the Finn M.W. Uh, Kepperson and Household uh, oh, in, <laughs> Household International Professor of Law and Economics. Sorry, I probably have something here <laughs> mistyped. Sorry, please correct uh, at the Harvard uh, Law School. Uh, he has published widely in fields of taxation, public economics, antitrust, law and economics, welfare economics, and, and moral philosophy, uh, and has been an economic and legal consultant to government entities and private parties. So you can see a lot of experience here. And then finally, uh, we have Dominic Vogt, who is a partner at Wilmer Hale's Antitrust and Competition Practice Group. Uh, Mr. Vogt served in several roles at the FTC, where he most recently served as the assistant director of one of our shops. Those who are familiar, uh, M2 uh, is the shop. Uh, he led the FTC's review of mergers, computer hardware and software, chemicals, and other industrial and technology-related uh, so we're very glad to have um, this very distinguished panel. Uh, as Dave mentioned, um, what we're going to focus on on this in this panel are the is the toolkit. Uh, for those of you who are just joining us on now and have not seen kind of the full the, the first workshop might seem like we're jumping into the middle of a conversation, but the idea is we want to really continue the discussion uh, that was started, kind of talking more about theories of horizontal and vertical concerns that was talked about in the first time. Um, uh, panel held a few weeks ago and really start diving uh, into the toolkit and the methods that I use. So with that in mind, I'm going to jump sort of um, straight in. And the first topic we're going to cover is to talk about market definition. Okay. So a common belief among many litigators is that the government typically loses cases on market definition. To get at this, the draft merger guidelines do a few things. Um, in 2010, the horizontal merger guidelines say that, uh, and I quote, the agencies may evaluate a merger in any relevant market satisfying the hypothetical monopolist test, end quote. At the same time, those same guidelines note that when relying on concentration in market shares, 
they usually do so, the agencies usually do so in the smallest relevant market satisfying the hypothetical monopolist test. The drafts rely more heavily on the idea that there really is no best market and that the requirement is to show harm in any market. So do we, do you, the panelists, think that this is a good idea? Will courts accept the idea that there are many potential markets and that the agencies only have to show harm in one? So Dom, maybe you can kick us off uh, and share your thoughts about this. Uh, great, thanks Aviv. Um, really excited, extremely distinguished panel. Uh, um, uh, I, I should start by saying that my, my comments are my own, uh, not comments associated with Wilmer Hale, any of Wilmer Hale's clients, um, and, and uh, will largely be based on, as Aviv said, my experience at the FTC litigating these cases. Um, I think it's a great question. It's an important question. I think the bottom line from my perspective is that it's a risky move. It's a risky move um, to, to move away from the notion what we're doing is analyzing the, the narrowest market that passes the hypothetical monopolist test. And I think it's a risky move because that has been a typical path to victory for the government in lots and lots of cases over the last several years. Uh, one case that comes to mind from my own personal experience uh, is a case involving coal that we litigated during the pandemic, um, Peabody Arch Coal. This is a case where the FTC um, sought to divide a, a narrow market for a particular type of coal that came from a particular place um, in Wyoming. Uh, so obviously a narrow market. And uh, the, the emerging party said, wait a second, uh, there's this stuff out there called really cheap that's eating coal's lunch and there's tons of competition. And so it's not reasonable just to look at um, competition for coal. And so we litigated this um, issue uh, very aggressively, both sides, and the court um, wrote a very well-reasoned opinion and acknowledged that there can be multiple markets. So I think courts can appreciate that point, um, but said very specifically in her decision uh, that it was this principle, this narrowest market principle um, which drove her to choose to apply um, the government's preferred market definition in that case. Uh, she accepted the defendant's uh, evidence that there was aggressive competition from natural gas. She said, you can't look away from it. It's all over the documents. She went through the brown shoe factors, which we may talk a lot about a little bit more today. Um, she essentially said both sides have probably proven markets under the brown shoe factors. But because of this narrowest market principle, um, the government wins this case because that if we don't look at the narrowest market, uh, if we look at broader markets, there's a chance we're going to miss a problem. And that's why we should go there. And I think that is a concept that was very important to the 2010 guidelines. It's a concept that the government has relied on a lot to win cases, not just this case, but also in the hospital area as well. Um, and so, you know, it it may be that the, the goal here is to add additional tools to the toolkit. Um, uh, but I think uh, if you soften the notion or if you shift the focus away from that, um, you, you, you take the risk that, that you may have had a different outcome in the cases um, where the court really focused on that, on that particular, um, on that piece. And, and, and frankly, on the, on the horizontal, on the hypothetical, hypothetical monopolist test in order to get there. Uh, Lee Moore, do you want to? Yeah, um, I, I have some. I have some. I have some comments to to supplement that and um, kind of support it, and also point out the the way in which that particular statement um, in, uh, underscores the primacy of the hypothetical monopolist test uh, uh, in terms of market definition. So let me start by expressing a sentiment that is very commonly held by economists, especially academic economists, and that's any step uh, that shifts antitrust battles away from market definition and toward competitive effects is a good step. Uh, and uh, <laughs> what my preference would be to keep in the state statement um, and maybe to change usually to may uh, use the smallest antitrust relevant market. And the reason is, as I said, that that, that particular statement um, underscores how it's the hypothetical monopolist test uh, that, that must be satisfied to make a market um, antitrust relevant. And it's a, a policing mechanism 
um, a limiting principle. It keeps enforcers honest because you can't allege a market that can't even theoretically be monopolized. The market has to include enough substitutes that constrain price or other terms such that the monopolist over these products in the relevant geographic area has market power. So I think it's important to signal in the statement that you may choose the smallest relevant market satisfying the HMT um, because that makes clear that there are many potential relevant markets and the smallest one may be the one that most illuminates the harm. Um, what concerns me with the current way in which the tools are included in Section 3, which is what covers market definition, is that it seems to me that it places the other tools on equal footing with the hypothetical monopolist test, which is listed as one of them. And that's uh, especially true uh, in my read where there's uh, the tool of looking at practical market indicia. And that seemed to me as a little close to endorsing ordinary course markets, which we all know. Um, and it, there's even a statement to this effect about colloquial markets may not be any trust relevant markets, but having the practical indicia on equal footing with the HMT seems to me to be uh, endorsing that a little bit too much. Um, Personally, there are a couple of there are two other tools there on direct evidence. I would argue that those tools on direct evidence be incorporated into the HMT to, to underscore that the HMT does not require uh, you know, quantitative empirical analysis, direct evidence, which could be quantitative empirical, but could also be, you know, uh, part of the record, uh, documents and whatnot can be used to establish uh, the HMT. So I would fold it in. Okay, uh, thank you. I probably have some follow-up questions, but actually let me build on uh, on your last point to kind of uh, get both uh, Lewis and Marty involved. So somewhat related kind of, I think you're um, or building on your last point in the draft merger guidelines in section three that discusses the um, market definition uh, as Dimo already alluded to, uh, there's three ways that are mentioned to find markets. Uh, there are really four, but two of them are very similar. Uh, first is by really, by direct evidence, right? So if there's direct evidence, of competition uh, between the firm, you could say they're competing in some market, even if that market hasn't been uh, defined, there's idea that there is a market out there. So that's one. The second is the so-called brown shoe. Um, very familiar for antitrust practitioners. If you're not, the idea is you basically go to documents and use practical indicia um, and try to use you know, market characteristics to say that's the market. Um, and these supposedly will usually define very relatively broad markets. So that's the second. And the third is the so-called hypothetical monopolist test that's uh, been uh, with us for a while. So um, that's what's um, in the guidelines. So Lewis, you've long advocated for kind of less emphasis on, uh, on market definition. Um, do you think that the changes that we talked about previously, including you know these changes here in the way that one could potentially um, talk about markets, um, take the agencies in a productive direction that uh, you've advocated for, and I assume we'll continue advocating. Yes. I know you have some slides. Yes. Um, Can we pull those up? So I will first um, correct Aviv's um, statement. Um, great. Kind of less is not quite what I've advocated. Um, the word is never. Um, and <laughs> since the, the technical term is it's alchemy, and I believe in never using it. But now let me um, you know, engage it a little bit more directly. So this is um, a diagram I used to help think about. And I'm gonna really talk about all four methods with this diagram. So at the left of the diagram, you have information or evidence. This could be brown shoe factors. This could be econometrics. This could be internal evidence from a company. This could be talking to a leading buyer who has sophisticated knowledge about substitution. Could be talking to people in energy markets all of the evidence. Um, I'm going to skip the blue for a moment. We're going to, at some point going to then decide on the market definition. And a typical debate, like the one teed up in the Cole case, is broad or narrow. If we go broad, the shares are going to be low. We're going to infer a low price increase, and we're going to say allow the merger. Merger. If we go narrow, the shares will be high. We'll infer the price increase is high, and we're going to block the merger. You can see that there's a real logical problem here, which my blue boxes indicate. Effects are being presumed from the shares in the market that one defined. And there's actually a lot of articles and writing and policy stuff by economists and lawyers 
about what HHI, Delta HHI, how should we do this, narrow or broad, but like, how did you actually pick the market in the first place? So should we use direct effects, by the way, effects of what? Like the current draft on A says, substantial competition between the parties. I have no idea what that means. In a perfectly competitive market, two people with adjacent stands selling wheat might be substantial competitors with each other, but that would not tell you much about the price effects of the merger. What is the HMT? Well, if we use the HMT, we have to decide whether it's the narrower or broader. We're going to go with the narrowest HMT market. What is that market? We need evidence. We need information. So what I'm suggesting here is the information, whether it's brown shoe factors, internal documents, econometrics, data, whatever it might be. What we ought to do, note this, this is pure reverse engineering. You might call it cheating. Um, if you're going to require market definition, is you take your best evidence on effects. And if the effects look bad, you want to block the merger. And if the effects look good, you don't want to block the merger. So those effects go into the market definition decision box. And you know, right now we have four things. Do the defendants get to pick the ones they prefer? If two out of three favor defendants and the fourth one doesn't really apply, do the defendants then win? What's our criteria for weighing these? We look at a brown shoe factor, interchangeability, kind of like cross elasticity. Should it be 2.3 to include it in the market, 5.7? No one's ever said. So we have all this spaghetti about effects. We're gonna somehow, and in the HMT, we're asking a specific question, whether a hypothetical monopolist could raise the price of a product 5%. Between you and me and most mergers, why do we care what a hypothetical monopolist would do if it's not a merger to monopoly or coordinated effects? Why do we care about what the actual merger would do, um, which will bring together those two products. So the bottom line from this I, is I think the clear thinking thing to do is that effects come first. And in terms of like how one could rewrite what's here, I think it could be a move in the right direction, even without a lot of modification. What it doesn't say now at the beginning of the list of A, B, C, D is we're looking at these things in order to determine what. The what is A, or what of the relevant markets? And by the way, I don't care if there are eight markets in which there's no harm. All I care about is, is there harm somewhere? If there's harm somewhere, we should look there and not somewhere else where there isn't harm. If there's harm nowhere, we shouldn't block the merger. So I think by clearly articulating, why are we doing this? If market definition is gonna be relevant, you've already heard what I think about that, but there's good support in the law that says the purpose of market definition is instrumental. It is a tool to help us figure out the effects. That suggests we should look at effects. And if we want to say which market definition is better or best, we need a criteria. And the criteria should be, well, let's look at a market where effects might be that we care about. And the mark, whatever circle or whatever it is you want to draw, that best is the bullseye, or at least maybe one ring out as to where those effects are likely to be. So this is a completely reverse engineered, instrumental, state the purpose, state why we're doing market definition in the first place, um, and then go about it in that way. And I think that it creates flexibility, but not the government or the private parties can do whatever the heck they want. The flexibility is pick the tools and pick the methods that best help you figure out what's going on in this merger. That's the criteria that should guide us. And I think, by the way, many federal district judges would say, hey, I guess that makes sense. They're saying the right market definition is the one that helps me figure out what's going on in the merger. That's a pretty appealing criteria. Thank you, Marty. Do you have anything you'd like to add? Yeah, just very briefly. Um, sure, I'm I'm going to agree that yes, effects. If we can if we can get them, that makes a whole bunch of sense. But um, market de definition is still going to be necessary. And just a couple quick things. I think that with regard to the guidelines, if the agencies can be as clear as possible about the principle, the criteria they'll use for selecting the relevant market, I think that would be an excellent uh, a revision to, to the current 
current draft, just to be very, very clear about that. And I, I think in terms of the the approaches, I, I agree with, with Lee Moore. I, I think underlying all this, right, there, um, there's, a, there's a linking of market definition and market power or competition or whatever we want to call it. And I think make, being very clear and explicit about that and how that works uh, across the various, they're not really distinct uh, takes on these things at all different ways at trying to get at the underlying issue, depending on the current the current specifics of the situation. So can, can, I, can I just add a couple more words on this? Because I, I, I do think um, I, I agree conceptually with the notion that the focus should be on effects. I think that's where, where um, the right place to be. But I would push back a little bit on the notion um, that that isn't already the case in most of these cases. Um, even if, from a legal perspective, we have this framework where we have to start with market definition and then talk about effects. Practically speaking, in every case I've ever litigated, you go present the entire thing to the court, including, and I've never litigated a case where we would have said, here's how we found market definition, we're done here. Um, you know, we don't have to talk about anything else because we've got a presumption and so let's be finished. That the government always is going to put on a whole bunch of evidence about effects and say this bolsters the presumption of harm. Um, and, and I think so. So I think it's a little overstated to say um, uh, that that we could we can only we need to only focus on effects, particularly where in mergers we, we all know that we're predicting the future, right? I mean, there's some evidentiary problems here focusing only on effects because there's limitations in what you can actually show. And so courts are going to be comfortable with what the cases tell them to do. And we have decades and decades and decades of case law that says step one is define a market. It is predicate to understanding the effects. That, that may be unfortunate, right? And I think that there's been sort of a long and slow effort to sort of undo that and think about it a different way. Uh, but, but I think district judges, when they look at the guidelines, if they look at the guidelines thinking of market definition and it does not look like the case law, then I think they are going to be less likely to turn to the guidelines. They're going to go turn to the prior case law. And so if the goal is actually to push the case law in, in that direction, um, I, I think it has to try and move it incrementally and not make a big shift to um, we're, we're not going to do market definition anymore. We're going to we're going to have sort of a radical change where we're going to only look at the effects. Just so, uh, Louis, just uh, we're going to go and talk about competitive effects. So we'll touch on these. Exactly. I just want to say a brief word about what Dom said about the cases. Um, and it, it just okay. Uh, why don't you? But yeah. I'd like to actually follow up on something that Dom said earlier. Oh. Uh, but why don't okay. you take uh, a uh, okay. Um, the don't go radical. I understand the impulse behind that, and I don't disagree. But I, as I said, saying that the purpose of the exercise is to help figure out the effects when we're doing the exercise, I think, does help. And I'm just going to then say a brief statement about having read lots of district court merger opinions. I give some an A, some a C, and some an F. The ones I give an A, and I would put like staples one in this category, that will resonate with some of you, is where the judge saw evidence of effects, understood it, and then reverse engineered the market definition in order to get that result. That I give an A. I will give a C to a case like Tax Act, where there's 40 pages on market definition, and there's like two paragraphs, four levels down in the subdivision, pointing to a later discussion of an effect as a make weight that tips them toward the government's market definition, but it's mostly decided on other factors. I think they got the right outcome, but mostly through confusion landing in a good spot. And then I'll give an F to certain cases. Um, Aviv may know one that I have in, in mind here, where the market definition tangle, whether it's brown shoe factors, Amex two side, or whatever it might be, got the judge sufficiently confused that they made a decision that based on the actual opinion, seems to have come out the opposite way from what their analysis of effects suggested. And I think that the more the government and the private parties says, this is a purpose of exercise, let's be clear about that, without necessarily extinguishing it um, formally, I think we can get a lot of progress. Okay, uh, thank you. So I think those of you out there that are preparing for the exam in Lewis's antitrust class, I think you know what you have to answer. Right. <laughs> um, uh, uh, but Dom, let me sort of take back um, uh, a little bit to something that you um, uh, said in your first comment, kind of your example of the uh, the coal case. So uh, the idea that we can potentially move away from a best market 
uh, relies heavily on something I think Lewis actually touched on in his comments, and the idea that we have to show harm in a market, right, in any market. Uh, we don't have to show that there's harm in all markets, because obviously, you know, mergers don't create harm in all markets, and that's uh, almost a tautology, right? So we just have to show a market. So obviously, we can't just make up something. There has to be some rules, but the idea is that you can, to get a, let's use the word valid market, you could use different tools. So what I heard from your response is you think if we're going to try to introduce, and not just from yours, from others as well, try to introduce additional tools, courts are maybe going to struggle with that. They really do want the idea of there's a best market uh, and not just the idea that there's the market, the government defined a valid market and we can show harm in that market. Do you think that's going to be I, risky? I, that, that's been my experience. I mean, I don't think when courts have a particular merger that they have to settle a particular dispute on, a high stakes dispute with lots of people in front of them. People have spent many hours of their life and, and millions of dollars preparing for that they have to settle it very quickly. I don't think they want a menu of options. I think they want an analytical framework which takes them to a decision, helps them get to a decision and decide, is this a good merger or is this a bad merger for consumers, right? And so I, I do think that the guidelines will, will probably not not be relied on as much by the court if what they do is say, well, there's a lot of different ways you can think about this. So choose one of these several, right? I think what, and, and this goes back to the Cole case, I, I, I think the, the court there acknowledged, the court said in that opinion, acknowledged the very point that you're making, uh, that that all that all that the government has to do is show the harm in any market in order to prevail, but still felt it necessary to go three or four or five paragraphs after that and say, but you know, because there can be lots of markets, it's very important that I, the court, identify what the right market is um, here. And I think that in that case, it was going to be outcome determinative. And that's why the court felt like they had to do that. What I think courts don't want to have is a situation where they feel like what the guidelines are doing is setting up a sort of heads I win, tails you lose situation, where there's just lots of options for the government. And if, if one of them doesn't work out, you can turn to another one. Courts do want to know if they're deciding the case correctly based on some sort of framework. And so I do think there will be some struggle with that. Uh, I'd like to kind of push us ahead to uh, competitive effect, but if any final comments on market definition, I want to give others opportunity. Yeah, just I, I think I'll just echo that. I can think of lots of cases, um, staples, premium ice cream, um, lemon juice, uh, that where this has really been been central and uh, and the way the courts think about it, I think is exactly what Dom said. So I think trying to find a way in the language of the guidelines to recognize that reality, but uh, of course, to, to be straightforward about what really happens in market delineation exercises. I think that's the key thing. Okay, um, okay let, let's move on to guideline, to, to competitive effect, but I'm sure uh, some of this discussion weigh in there as well. So uh, guidelines one to three uh, contain elements that were present in 2010. And just to remind everyone that's not fluid in the numbers of the guidelines. Guideline one is the one that sets a structural presumption, a threshold based on HHIs and Delta HHIs. Guideline two looks at what we traditionally called unilateral effects, and guideline three looks at coordinated effects, uh, all in the context of horizontal mergers. Okay, um, so they present elements that were you know that were present in the horizontal merger guidelines of 2010. However, the draft merger guidelines suggest that the agencies will be willing to challenge a merger on the basis of only one. Uh, of these uh, of these guidelines. So the question is, how will this work in practice? And Tom, I think this touches on something that you've already mentioned earlier. Uh, will it lead to changes in how cases are litigated? Uh, and if so, what will these cases look like? So Tom, again, maybe as the litigator, you can uh, lead us off and then others will win. Yeah, no, I'm happy to start. I, I, I don't know that sort of from a practical perspective, thinking about the litigation, and maybe we're not we're not here to talk about litigation procedure, that from a procedural perspective, I don't know that it's going to change much. Because as I said before, in reality, the, the government is the plaintiff. The government's going to get up and put on their entire case and talk about all the things that that um, benefit their case, um, and including, you know, potentially trying to pre the evidence of the other side. The other side's going to stand up and make all of their points, and the judge is going to sort it all out. So I don't know that it's going to change things sort of from a practical perspective. But, but I do think it, as you read the guidelines, it strikes me as a little confusing about how this will work, right? So it, it is the point that um, maybe there's a merger where 
um, the government is unable to show a presumption based on shares, right? That they either try and fail because the government rejects it or the court rejects it, or they're just low shares. Um, and, and the way this works is that that, that means that they, they, the government will still challenge the merger as long as under guideline two, there's sort of close competition. Um, I think that that again, you know, there could be some discomfort with that framing for the court, because again, it's this notion that it's just kind of trying to provide additional pathways for the government to prevail. So you've, you haven't met your presumption. There's no presumption of harm, but we're just going to go on and, and continue to have additional tools. But I, I actually think that existed before. I mean, the court, the, the agencies could still press forward with the case, even if they don't have a presumption, right? And, and if you look at the original Arch Cole case, the court said, you, you don't have a presumption, you've lost on market share, uh, but still went through and analyzed the competitive effects and said, so therefore you lose. Um, the agencies might find occasion to, to say, even where we lose on market share, don't have a presumption, we still think we have great competitive effects evidence, and so we're going to press forward anyway. Um, but but it, it is, it's a little unclear to me how these three guidelines, if they're going to operate independently, how, how that will work. Okay. Um, Louis, I'd like to turn to you, but maybe kind of to set things up to kind of respond uh, a little bit to what Dom said. Um, you could imagine a situation actually very much in line with what you've just advocated for, where market definition Jesse. And the idea is that, you know, instead of fight kind of this battle over exactly the boundaries of the um, of the market, we decide there's very good evidence of competitive. Can we go directly to it? And that's what guideline two tries. What are your thoughts on that? Is that actually in line with what you were just advocating for, or will you have to have in mind something different? Is that to me or? Uh, Louis, that's to okay, me. Okay, great. Uh, and I once again, a, I think we have another slide. Yes, a grand total of one more. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I agree and really with second pretty much everything Dom said. So I think at the end of the day, um, not a lot turns on this. Um, is it coming or? Huh? Not quite sure where the magic is. Well, I, I will. Okay, great. Um, so, so this is the. So let's imagine a unilateral effects challenge, which many of you will will know know what I mean by that. So we're talking about direct loss of competition between the merging parties. So guideline one would be the structural presumption, and guideline two would be like showing those direct effects and loss of competition. So I will start in the upper left and lower right corners, which I consider boring. If you don't violate either guideline, the merger is not going to be challenged, or if it's challenged and the court thinks neither is satisfied, um, the government will lose. Um, if you're in the lower right corner, where you've got high shares and proof of effects, um, in that corner, presumably, um, it's going to be irrelevant whether you used one, the other, or both, um, the government will, um, will win that challenge. So we're kind of interested in diagonals, and I'll start on the upper right, the one that's in green, and it's the one that was sort of really just being suggested, um, which is what if one could show direct unilateral effects that will mean prices will go up, wages will go down, whatever it is that we're in, but we're really iffy or not there on the structural presumption. The correct result is the government should win, and it could do it in one of two ways. Say we only need guideline two and we don't need guideline one, or back to the reverse engineering, say, well, now that we've proved the effects, doesn't that mean the right market is the narrow market, the lower red one, and therefore we win? So resolve the ambiguity on market definition by going with the effects. So let me just talk briefly about the lower left, the red one that I'm calling erroneous. So let's say, and this also arguably with proper reverse engineering would never arise. So let's say, that effects are no, by which no, I don't mean can't be proven with absolute rocket certainty 99%. I mean, our best understanding is there are no bad effects and maybe even good effects. And the, a fact finder might be convinced of that. Yet, somehow through some looking at round true factors or whatever, it looks like there should be a narrow market and high shares. That would be a wrong outcome. Now, of course, you can avoid that wrong outcome, the one in the other direction, again, by just reverse engineering, which is to say, if the effects proved are little, none, unlikely, the merger is even desirable, well, why not just reverse engineer, go to the top green, draw the broad market, and then you don't have to worry about the conflict. So this whole juxtaposition of market definition, presumption, and effects, when as Dom said, 
the government is going to put in a lot of stuff and a few superficial mentions of brown shoe factors, pick your favorite three that um, anyone could testify to. The government's not going to run with that case. They're not going to bring that case. That's just not going to happen. So I don't know ultimately that it matters how much guideline one or even the structural presumption is there. I think it's something that judges in a, in a case where they're thinking clearly are just sort of hiding behind as an extra layer to sort of um, justify their opinion. But there's not, there at least should not be action as long as the government or merging parties, whoever has the better on the facts, is being clear about what they're doing. So, so one more one more reaction too on this, and I think this is a little bit more just kind of a practical reaction of how this could play out because because I think all of that makes really good sense. But you know, when you're dealing with a district judge who this might be their first antitrust case, their second antitrust case, their first merger case, and they haven't thought about this deeply, and they have a, a busy docket of things that probably are much more important than this thing, no matter how many dollars it's worth. Um, you know, I, I think I think district judges um, uh, uh, that they're they're going to come back to the things that are easy for them, right? And and that's their case law, right? And so at the end of the day, um, that they they want to start with market definition because that's what all the cases ask them to do, and work their way, um, you know, sort of through this this uh, this traditional analysis. And and if we if the guidelines say you can skip a step, um, that that like many 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 years of of sort of case law say you ought to start with. I think they're going to be sort of uncomfortable with that, uh, but but it, as you say, I mean, it, it, at some point, if we think this is the wrong analysis, you have to you have to push back on that. Just a small word on the district judges who've not heard the case before. So the only empirical study I did in my life was the following: How many merger cases does the mean U.S. federal district judge hear in their entire career mean of eighteen years? The answer is zero point three. So we've got District of Columbia and some other places where they're hearing many. <laughs> All the others are hearing zero, or if they hear one, it's their first, and they're also probably thinking my last. Well, good, good luck that I never have to look again. Yeah. So the question is, to a judge- Maybe if you gave them less yeah, Fs, you'd yeah, be more willing yeah, to, yeah, to look yeah. at them. So the question is, if you have a judge and a law clerk who did not have the good fortune to take my antitrust <laughs> class or Daniel's or anybody else's, which is easier to understand? Judge, listen to all this evidence, and try to figure out whether you think the merging firms are going to raise their price. Or judge, look at all the evidence, these vague brown shoe factors, and answer the metaphysical question that no one has defined as to which is the better market. Or, oh, wait, look at the formula with the HMT in the appendix. Go through the steps, which, by the way, you're going to have to figure out lots of stuff to know how to do any of those steps, and figure out how that mechanism comes out with an answer. And I will just offer an assertion a conjecture, I have no evidence, that it's not at all obvious that to the judge who's unfamiliar, that the second one is so much more straightforward and they're more likely to think clearly than if they're thinking about the first simple question of what we actually care about. But, well, but I think the, so the easiest guess, thing- Let me for, try to move us um, no. ahead. I think it's, I mean, if, they do is rely on the presumption, which is why they do it, and that's the problem, right? But they have to find the market to do that, but it's and not. that's and that's why they get focused on it. But that I think that is the easiest path. That's why they go to it. And when once you're once you're, once you're out of the presumption and you're thinking about what the effects are, I think judges actually require far more evidence for the government to prevail. It makes the case harder for the government. That's what you see in the vertical cases, right? And I think just to build on that, um, I like your table very much, except that it's it's a nice table in the sense that you know it's in the nice in the classroom. But in reality, we don't know the no and yes. It's really, you know, a lot of question marks kind of that you had on, on top. And sometimes these are very hard, both to the agencies and for everyone to figure out. And the question is at that point, do we have an administrative, uh, you know, process that we can actually um, uh, push forward on? But anyway, let me try to kind of move us ahead because I'm, uh, I'm looking at the clock. So, um, uh, Limor, in, uh, in your research, you found that mergers between hospital systems uh, with little to no local overlaps um, can lead to higher prices. Um, do you think that the draft merger guidelines are going to provide the frameworks that would allow the agencies to challenge us, uh, such mergers? Uh, thanks very much for the question. Uh, I, I have here with me, so I can show you after our panel, uh, my copy of the draft Merge. And when I got to the section that I think is most relevant to this, lots of underlining and stars and exclamation points. So I think it is fair to say that I rejoiced 
<laughs> to see that the draft merger guidelines spell out some concerns um, about certain combinations, specifically those that could extend a dominant position into a related market through tying or bundling, which is the end of guideline seven for those following at home. Um, and I also consider some of the concerns raised about mergers that entrench a dominant position um, as helpful for combating these types of transactions. I just wanted to throw out a very quick example of, of uh, what I of how I read this guideline. Uh, and that's partly because there aren't examples. So as you have heard uh, from others, I do think that the examples uh, in, in adding examples to the guidelines to illustrate what you mean, uh, even if it's not exhaustive, would be helpful. So my example, um, and then we'll I'll learn at some point if that was an accurate example. So if a dominant hospital system in Houston, okay, my hometown, acquires a dominant hospital system or just a hospital system, I should say, in Dallas, and that decreases the chances that an insurer excludes the hospital system in Dallas from its statewide network, um, then that acquisition may lessen competition in Dallas. That's how that's how I, I read that. And I also wanted to correct a misperception that such a cross-geography also called cross-market transaction, that that would mean an anti-competitive effect um, arising from mergers that don't compete. To the contrary, even firms that are distant both physically or, or just physically, just in product space, um, they in fact can, even if they're not competing for end consumers, compete uh, for a place with the intermediary. And that's, I think, what the bundling is referencing. That's a lessening of competition. Um, but one more plug, uh, which seems unlikely to uh, uh, yield uh, a change in, in this regard, but I'll, I'll at least put it out there, is that defining an antitrust relevant market when the harm um, potentially arise, when it's the market within the market that they're competing, uh, it it might not be illuminating and it would be fantastic to uh, affirmatively assert kind of the optionality of, uh, of defining a market in these cases where we're talking about this kind of entrenchment or extension. Not sure we have the power to do that. I mean, I think ultimately it's up to, uh, <laughs> Fair enough. to the courts, but I think what, you know, what I've heard before is it's a matter of defining the, the market that captures the competitive effects. I mean, Lewis used the term reverse engineer. Yeah. Not sure I would endorse that term, but uh, but try to get the, the concept. Uh, Marty, uh, what's your thought? I know you've done a lot of work on hospitals, you know, specifically here or sure. More broadly. Well, I'll, I'll just be brief, and and I'm going to agree with with Lee Moore. That for lawyers, that that's concur. In case you didn't understand what that word means. Uh, <laughs> so. The key thing is really focusing on the nature of competition. So as Lee Moore said, a hospital in Dallas and a hospital in Houston may very well be competing to be in the network of an insurer that offers a regional or national plan for, for large employers. And, and that's really the key thing. And in that sense, I mean, the guidelines certainly encompass that as well. Um, I think the, the term cross market has been used to refer to these, particularly in the hospital space. And I think that is, uh, is a bit of a misnomer, but I think, the, I, I think in some sense, it's kind of standard operating procedure for the agencies, just be very clear about the nature of competition. Thank you. So let me kind of skip um, a little bit ahead. Lee Moore, you touched on um, guideline seven. That's the guideline for, for those, again, who are not following exactly with numbers. That's the guideline that discusses um, mergers that entrench and extend the market power of a dominant firm um, defined as a firm with 30% market share. Uh, Dom, I just happen to know that you have pretty strong opinions on that. Uh, would you care to share it with us? Yeah, well, I've, I've used referring to the lunch we just had where we had some discussion about this. I, I, I do, I had, a, I did have a strong reaction to, 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 and I don't think I'm alone in this regard, uh, to guideline seven in particular. And, and I think it's related to an overall reaction to guidelines generally, which is that uh, the guidelines are most useful, I think, to courts in particular. Um, where there's some level of consensus around the point that's being made. Because what that means is when you go to court, the parties accept the guidelines as the appropriate framework. The parties don't fight about what the guidelines should say. And then courts will say, this is the right way to think about this, and then settle the dispute using the ideas and the guidelines. 
And um, when you get further away from consensus, the further away you get, I think the less likely the court's going to follow um, whatever is being debated in the particular guideline. And this was one to me where I looked at it and said, I don't feel like there's a lot of consensus here. It feels very broad. Um, I don't really understand what the parameters are. And, you know, sort of practically speaking, being somebody who's now uh, uh, advising clients on a day-to-day -day basis on, on what this guideline would mean for actual mergers that they're trying to decide whether they will pass muster. Um, you know, it, it defines as dominant uh, uh, a firm that has a 30% a share of any product and then has a, an extremely broad um, sort of description of what the agencies might consider um, pursuing uh, related to that product market or in a product or any other product market where that um, company sells products or the, or the emerging party sells products. And so the concern I have is that the court is going to look at a guideline like this and say, this feels like a blank check for the agencies to investigate whatever they want. Right. I mean, lots of firms have 30% share of something. Uh, and, and I don't think um, when it's sort of that open-ended and there are sort of parameters around it, some parameters uh, and, and parameters perhaps could be built in, uh, that, that courts are going to be willing to sort of go down that road. I think they're going to be very, um, they're going to be very reticent to, to, to sort of endorse that kind of theory unless there's more meat on the bones. Okay. Thank you. Uh, does anyone else like to add anything to this? Uh, I just, the only thing I would say is that it, it strikes me as um, further emphasizing market definition and opening up just a different set of cases in which to have that fight, which obviously we want fewer of. Okay. Um, all right, let me actually build on that and kind of step uh, a little back in terms of numbers of guidelines, step back to vertical merger. So the draft merger guidelines introduce in guideline six, a uh, structural presumption uh, for vertical mergers. Uh, do you think this is a good, I mean, and this, I think it's fair to say the response we've gotten in fact, some people love it. Uh, some people have really pushed back on it for some of the reasons uh, we've also talked about in guideline um, seven. So, um, do you think it's a good idea? Would you modify this presumption? Um, for example, by stating that the relevant product, the, um, the uh, related product uh, needs to be important uh, or that the competition and the relevant product market where there's harm needs to be substantial. Uh, should this be incorporated in guideline five, which is a more traditional vertical analysis? Um, what are your thoughts? Marty, do you wanna kick us off? Sure, um, so just a, a few things first. Um, not not on this point, but I, I think it's important here that um, there's no presumption uh, that vertical mergers are necessarily pro-competitive. I think that's an important point. Um, efficiencies are not presumed. It includes el elimination of double marginalization. Uh, those things can um, and should be established, but I don't think they should be presumed. On um, the harms side, I think I think I understand. Um, the desire and the usefulness of presumptions, they're helpful, I think, to, to everybody, not just to the agencies. The 50% market share, I think, I don't quite understand and I have some concerns about. So, for example, one might say have a presumption if, um, if there's a vertical merger and the upstream firm is, is critical supplier to downstream rivals so much so that uh, if their, their access were foreclosed as a result of the merger, there'd be uh, uh, clear harms uh, to competition, sort of defined competitive effects. That could be a presumption. You could go the other way with regard to, um, I said upstream, you go downstream. That kind of thing, does 50% capture that? Is that sort of a shorthand way? It's not clear to me. Um, so. Uh, I think maybe being a bit more tar clear about what exactly the purpose uh, of this is, what the presumption is trying to get at, and then why is it that market share of a certain percentage is uh, is useful in, in getting that. So um, I, I'm less than sanguine uh, about about that in in particular. Um, it, one other thought is that really. Uh, guidelines five, six, and and seven are are really closely linked, and making that clear, I think. So you know, talking about complements, for example, entrenchment, making those links clear 
um, and how they all play into each other, I, I think would be very helpful. I know the next panel will talk about platforms, but these also um, uh, play into the guideline about platforms as well. Louis? Yes, um, I'd like to make some comments that are more parallel or complementary um, as opposed to a particularly on the That's presumption. Yes, comments. yes, um, compliments about compliments. Um, so perhaps because as Aviv was saying when doing introductions that some of us are, let's just use the word old. Um, I remember once upon a time over a course of decades, um, that there was a vast literature on vertical relationships and integration. And I don't mean to say that this is either pro presuming efficiencies or anti vertical mergers. It's just like, so what are like the main considerations in vertical relations? There are fields like theory of the firm, contract theory, organizational economics, depending on how you count, we have five or six Nobel prizes in this group. None of that work and none of those ideas appear in barely any writing on this subject in the antitrust IO community for the last 15 years or are reflected in any way in these guidelines. And I don't, again, I don't mean to say that if you included them and were more fulsome, that this would come out like more challenging or more not challenging. I'm just saying like, what should we actually be thinking about? So vertical is really understood to be more about compliments. Vertical is just how you draw something on a blackboard or a whiteboard or construct your slide. It's really talking about compliments. Compliments can involve double marginalization depending on the contracting. They can involve raising rivals costs. By the way, many of the ways of contracting around the double marginalization problem create the raising rivals costs incentives even without the merger. So that's a further complexity. Combining complements avoids holdup problems. This goes way back. It affects ex ante incentives in innovation. It also can create issues on the anti-competitive side that have long been discussed. Like it may be harder for an entrant if they have to enter two areas simultaneously. And then we get further things that make it complicated. I'm sorry, the bottom line of this comment is gonna be, it's a lot more complicated, <laughs> um, but I think we have to like face up. These are not details or rare things. These are like central. So on one hand, I might like self-preference or deny access to my rivals. But on the other hand, and one can read the recent FTC complaint about Amazon, by actually making it available to rivals and even inducing them to come in, that prevents the growing of a separate independent market that would facilitate entry and competition. <laughs> So my sense is, is the vertical area is quite important. I do not have strong priors about when, where, and how we should challenge. I've on and off been spending a lot of time in my last six years working about mergers and now on a new project, trying to understand these things better. Um, I don't have a good sense of what guideline I would write today, and I'm not going to unfortunately be as helpful as I would like to be or, or as focused, but I think it is worth noting that there are these large and substantial literatures, again, with Nobel prizes going with them and the like, these aren't little squirrely papers here and there, raising first order considerations, some that are as or more important or that complicate and fold back arguments, both pro and against vertical mergers that I think really require a lot more thinking and whether we do whatever this time, but put it front burner to like over the next 10 years, try to really up our game here, I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, following up on that, I think, and this is, goes back to Marty's comment, I, I agree with all of that. There is so much to unpack with vertical, but one reaction I have is, if that's where we are, why are we starting with a presumption? Because to me, a presumption is only useful if it's really backed by all of that work and is backed by all of that experience, case law, agency work, knowledge, <laughs> to say, we know that in this circumstance, there's likely to be a problem. And if you can back it up, then the courts will follow presumption and it will be extremely useful. But if it's not backed up, if you just drop it in there, then courts aren't going to follow it. So let me, uh, Marty, I'll turn to you in a second, but let me let me try to restate this in a slightly different, walking away from numbers. And let me say a statement and let me see how you respond to it. So suppose there's a merger that gives a firm or makes a firm a monopoly over an input that's important for its rivals to compete. At that high level, putting aside all the kind of theory stuff, is that a merger 
that at this high level you think would raise concerns? And if so, can we now start in saying, let's unpack that. What do we mean by monopoly? Well, there is some case law that's somewhere around 50%. That's when you can start talking about monopoly. You need the input to be important. You need it to be you know, important to a rival or a substantial rival. Um, and that's what it's trying to get to. So I'd love to hear your response to the, well, both the general statement, but then maybe the unpacking to the specifics of this guideline. Marty, you wanna go first? Yeah, sure. Well, I think, I think that's a good example. So um, the, the issue is not market share per se, right? The issue is sort of the nature of the market and what we expect to happen post acquisition. Now, again, if market share can capture that, great. But um, I would say um, either uh, adopt presumptions that are more specific in the way you first said, or talk about those things and then make clear why it is the guidelines are using 50, 50%. Okay, so I think what I heard you say is if 50% is equated to monopoly, that's okay, but you need to additional additional qualifications like what I added in my statement. I'm, I don't want to put words in your mouth. I, yeah, yeah, that's great. I mean, I just throw one 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 comment out at you is sitting here. I'm thinking, yes, I'm 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 concerned about that type of a of a transaction could uh, raise rivals' costs, foreclose competitors, or result in just higher market uh, prices and uh, and uh, loss of consumer welfare, which. Uh, whether the guidelines mention it or not, uh, certainly matter to me. Guess what I'm wondering is, uh, does this presumption actually make the, the uh, give the agencies uh, a bigger challenge? Why is that? 50% sounds very high to me. I know there's case law there, okay? But I imagine that this raising rivals costs that a lot of these scenarios arise even with much less share. And that if you stick 50% in there, that might um, anchor judges or opinions on that and then actually possibly make it harder to win matters in other circumstances. So, so. effectively it could be read as a safe harbor of if you're less than 50%. Yes. Well, I mean, Thank you. Yes. That's covered in 6B, but I think what you're saying is it might become so salient that courts might only respond to that. I think it's hard to, uh, I mean, you can tell me or, or maybe somebody could tell me if if uh, merger cases are one when they don't satisfy the presumptions. I haven't seen a complaint uh, that I've read that that is filed that doesn't satisfy. So it might be considered your floor as opposed to, yeah, helpful. So what, one other thought, this is really a, a question. I, I, I'm of at least two minds uh, of this, maybe more, but, um, on the one hand, I think having a guideline about vertical non-horizontal here is very helpful because there's so many mechanisms that work together and that this captures that there's a lot of stuff going on, right? I mean, uh, even a small part of what Lewis raised and we did have separate vertical merger guidelines. So I, I don't quite know what that means. And I know you're trying to be concise and clear, but maybe a little more in in this particular matter would be helpful. And I can't remember, I think we, at lunch earlier, somebody pointed out, look, um, when there's a court trying to deal how to uh, how to figure out how to deal with something, they're gonna look at the guidelines that are relevant to the case that's in front of them. They're, they're not gonna sit down and read through the entire document. Mm -hmm. So expanding a bit obviously makes the document longer. There's more that has to be read and digested, but it might actually, again, judiciously used, uh, be, be helpful, particularly here. Well, I, I, I just think if, if you want courts to accept it, it might be just necessary. Because if you look at the last couple vertical cases, what courts said was, you know, they said in Microsoft Activision, they said at United Change, there's no shortcuts here. This is the first point that the courts make. You don't get a shortcut like you do in horizontal. Um, so we got to really dig in. And you got to prove to me how this harm is going to happen. And you have to prove it with lots of evidence and lots of minutia. And that makes it very hard for the government to win cases, frankly. Um, you know, so I, I think that if you're going to get courts to to change that, if you're going to say that's that's actually wrong, that there, there is a shortcut, you, you really got to back up what the basis for that shortcut is. Okay. Um, okay. Moving us uh, along. Uh, someone keeping time. How are we for time? I'm sorry. No, no, my straight job. ahead. Five so minutes. Nineteen minutes. Twenty okay. minutes. So uh, wait, five or twenty? Yeah. yeah. If you're going till three o'clock. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I wasn't sure if we we're going to three or to quarter. But, um, 
Uh, okay, so let's um, uh, dive into a little bit of um, at least one point else that are um, uh, in the appendix of some of the um, the economics. So, uh, Marty, let me kind of refer this to you, but I'm happy to have others um, weigh in as well. So the draft merger guidelines added language uh, to explain that, you know, the availability uh, uh, or quality of data or reliable modeling technique might limit the availability and relevance of economic model. And this is really to deal with um, uh, with the so-called sometimes CSI effect, not to create this sort of uh, idea that every single time we have to go through uh, some of the modeling that, you know, uh, Lewis referred to, so, you know, we have to go and write down a complete model and estimate it on data and run a merger simulation um, and so forth. Um, at the same time, also, the draft merger guidelines recognize, and I'm quoting here, that the goal of economic modeling is not to create a perfect representation of reality, but rather to inform an assessment of the likely change in firm's incentive. Um, Marty, kind of from your experience at the FTC and kind of um, elsewhere, do uh, you think these are um, these are helpful changes. Will they help deal with any issues that you've seen? Yeah, I, I think yes and no. So um, I think, again, clarifying what constitutes productive economic analysis is very helpful. These could be read, though, as creating sort of a false dichotomy. So in my opinion, it, it's not a question of whether economic analysis or modeling is important. It's always important with regard to, to mergers of antitrust generally. The question is, what is the most productive kind of economic analysis? Detailed econometric models can be very, very productive and useful in merger cases. So it would be your work in Aetna Humana is a great example of that. It's gonna depend on data availability. It's gonna depend on time, the quality of the data. But in some other cases, one might not do that. One might calibrate a model. One might uh, look at some simple numbers or facts, but that doesn't mean economic analysis is absent, far from it. Economic analysis is what is guiding what we do and telling us this is what we should look at and then practical considerations come to the fore. So I think it's helpful to be clear about what can constitute productive and useful economic analysis and it help explain what that is and explain it's not always going to look the same way. It won't always be the same thing. It also may be useful to try and clarify to courts, again, not what that is, so that um, when defendants come up and either produce something very complicated or allege that the analysis, economic analysis, say, done by the agencies is not useful because it wasn't a, a full-blown a, a, a detailed econometric model that there's something that in the document that helps establish that that's not that's not necessarily the case. So I think here I think a bit more explanation. I think I would frame it the way I said. I, you don't have to agree with that. And I think also some examples would be helpful. I'd like to just um, pile on a little bit on that. And um, by the way, um, I am actually not remotely and even in my very um, first article attacking market definition the, we always have to do econometrics or something like that quite the opposite and again this is a place um, and a few of you will recognize it overlapping with comments I made in a, a lunch discussion we had earlier today to me it would be great if the guidelines were more direct in what we're trying to do it's there's some in appendix one on sources of evidence which I find a bit shorter and I'd rather it be actually longer than what was in the analogous part of the 2010 guidelines. What we're trying to do is to do the best we can with uncertainty and predicting what the effects of the merger will be of a certain sort. How does one do that generically? One looks at all relevant sources of evidence and my favorite word is triangulate, that you put them together and intersect them in various ways. And the thing I would perhaps be most inclined to attack, actually, if I was gonna attack something, is an approach often used, I don't know what often means, I'll just say at least with some frequency used by defendants in merger cases and other antitrust places that just keep saying, prove more, prove more, prove more, I poke at this, I poke at that, but I don't have to give any other analysis. To put it as, it is our job under the statute and everything else to do the best we can to figure it out 
and to attack when there's a certain kind of probability um, and not certainty. And to even say that we will do our best to respond and to consider tensions and angles, but the competing view of here's some things we still don't know and therefore who knows what, that that's like not a real argument. I don't know a good way, I haven't figured out how to draft it into the guidelines, but to me, that's the biggest danger. I look at recent opinions. So we have the quasi merger opinion in American Jet Blue, which I was just rereading part of before this panel. Um, I read not that long ago, reread the Cisco case um, that I know some folks here, um, you know, had some involvement with. And in many others, what judges can readily be induced to do is to try to put it together. So I see a judge writing things like, well, this expert says this, that expert says that, but when I look at the course of dealing documents or the things from the industry, it's much more consistent with this way of putting it than with that way of putting it. So I think that's the better method. But the general idea is we're gonna look at all different types of evidence. We're gonna figure out what is most probative in the particular case. We're gonna triangulate, things will reinforce, things will cut into each other. <laughs> That, that affirmatively is what the enterprise is. And in some ways it's almost so obvious no one ever says it, but I think it might not be such a bad thing to crisply say it and then make comments about how different things um, fall into place under that. Just, well, I, I think that's that's really, really important point. All of that is economic analysis. So not just building and calibrating a model or estimating something econometrically or even looking at data, right? documents and statements also constitute that at a hundred percent. I have a, I have a non-economic reaction to that as well, though, which is, which is in defense of merging parties a little bit here. Uh, uh, I, I think a lot of merging parties have mergers that just don't raise any issues at all. That's most mergers in the world, frankly, in my view. Um, and, and they just want to look at the guidelines and be able to say, are we good here? And I think there is some concern with some of the discussion and with looking at the draft, you know, you, if you push out into some of the new theories that, again, in my view, are not as well accepted, including guideline seven and some others, um, you know, you know, yet, and, and you, and you take the view that, you know, the government's role is just to explore every possible thing and see if there's any problems anywhere. You can go on a really, 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 you can go, go down a really far road and require a huge amount of analysis and a huge amount of product markets on a huge, huge amount of different things for deals that just in reality don't really cause a problem. And, and at a high level, I do think that these guidelines, that, that there is a problem there, that there are so many new things that people like me are going to have to counsel our clients on, on deals that would have spent, you know, just a few hours thinking about and make the filing and they probably clear and, and nobody would have ever thought about them. Um, I think there's a real concern there. So I think it, I agree that there needs to be an effort to be clear about what the goal is, what the goal is, but there also needs to be clear may, maybe, and this is through examples or other ways to say, here are the parameters around that. Here's where there's not a problem. Cause I don't see a lot of that in these guidelines at all. It's, it seems to be much more about providing more tools for the government to challenge more mergers and, and not providing a lot of guardrail where, you know, you don't need to worry too much about this. Um, so can I, um, so I, we've gone on to, you know, okay. an interesting topic that I think, I want to continue in a second. I just want to, you know, uh, maybe kind of go back to a point, kind of the original, you know, yeah. question about, you know, methods and kind of what's the requirement, what's in some sense, almost the burden of proof. Um, so Dom, have you ever had the experience? Because what I hear here and also in our previous discussion is like, yeah, we want to have a lot, maybe everything, right? We have, want to have a structural presumption. We want to have models. We want to have econometric evidence if we can. We want to have documents. We want to have customers. And sure, that's the case if we can. Uh, some cases we don't have all of that. Uh, some cases, even if we do, there's a matter of, you know, agency's time, court's time. Do we need all of that? That somewhat creates this idea that, you know, we always have to have it, the so-called CSI effect. Uh, again, turning to you as kind of the, the litigator, the one that's actually probably spent the most time of all of us in court, what's your impression of that? What's Is there a way to try to, convince courts to sort of move away from that and pick up on what Marty said, saying, look, if what you do as an economist is you tell an econ 101 story based on document, that's still economic analysis. Because sometimes courts kind of look at that and say, you haven't done any real analysis. You see decisions on that. What's your thoughts on, on that point? 
policy? I mean, it's a great question. It's a hard question. I think a lot of a lot of this, in my view and in my experience, is sort of about case selection, right? It's because because I do think that what courts think about the about um, antitrust generally is going to be colored by the few cases that actually make it to them and the facts of those cases and what they think about them. And so I think the agencies always have to be very careful about their case selection to try and put cases in front of the agencies that will um, will sort of be able, allow them to say, here are the tools that we're going to use, here's why they make sense, and then get courts to endorse those tools um, so that they can be used in the future. But I, and so, and so I think that's, that's an important part of this. But I guess I also think that, um, you know, there, there is a, there, there is a, a, um, a, a sort of a countervailing, there's a countervailing thing that for both the government and, and parties as a, as a manager of a merger shop, you, you can't, there has to be parameters around what you're going to investigate. It can't be sort of endless, right? So, so you have to say, if you, you know, here a, mer a merger filing walks through the door, you've got 30 days, maybe 60 to come to a very complex decision around it. You, you find a way to prioritize and think about the things that actually matter. Those are the things you want to focus on in the guidelines, right? And if you have some of these broader guidelines, um, which, which can take you down a lot of, I think, frankly, rat holes sometimes, you can spend a lot of resources doing all these things that are not focused on um, where, where you actually want to be in front of the courts, you know? And so, you know, that, it makes sense to sort of focus on um, what, what are the, what are really the true goals that you're trying to accomplish? What are the kinds of transactions in a very specific way that you really think um, we should be focused on um, and really focus there and maybe do a little bit less in terms of saying, and here, here are a bunch of other things we could also think about um, as well. Okay. I think we have about six minutes left. So why don't we kind of, go down the row and kind of, you know, closing comments, reactions to some of these last uh, uh, last points. So, Limor, maybe we can start with you. Um, sure, okay, because while I'm a, a professor of public policy here at the Kennedy School, I'm also a business school professor. I have a compliment sandwich, okay, for the for my friends at, at DOJ and FTC who are working on this. So the first the first thing I wanna do, top top uh, or bottom slides of the, of the sandwich is I actually wanted to call out a guideline. And that is guideline nine, which is on serial acquisitions, which highlights that the agencies are going to consider any one acquisition in the context of proceeding or future planned acquisitions, um, and that the outcomes of prior transactions will be considered in evaluating um, the current transaction under review. Um, and that directly addresses a lot of roll-up strategies that have been happening, particularly in healthcare, although I imagine there are a lot of industries where that is occurred, big source of concern, and the subject of hundreds, if not thousands of comments that you've received. So um, the, the, the uh, compliment there is uh, thank you for guideline, set, uh, guideline nine. All right. Now the, the slightly tougher layer uh, is uh, that like many others, I, I personally feel the language on protecting competition and the purpose of doing so is important um, because there are places in the guidelines where it comes off as the goal of deconcentration uh, and to some degree protecting competitors, which is what can enable deconcentration um, is an objective. And I think we ultimately do want our enforcers to weigh in um, in cases where the transaction could potentially potentially cause harm to consumers, employees, those kinds of stakeholders, all right? And then uh, the third piece, that's the easy part, the top part of the compliment and sandwich, oh, yes is here, uh, that I'm actually personally stunned and quite deeply impressed at how much feedback the agencies are soliciting because many, uh, when you have interactions with the agencies, there's, you know, the the stone face and the, you know, maybe we're listening, maybe we're not. And you're really listening and you're really soliciting a lot of input, comments before, comments after, panels like this, sessions. Uh, so I'm uh, pretty sure that you're going to come up with a great product. Thank you for soliciting our views. Thank you, Marty. Aviv, the day that a court asks for an expert to do real analysis, I will pay you $100 in, uh, in real numbers. They're recording this. They're recording this. <laughs> <Okay>. Yeah. <laughs> we it's, got that on the record, it's right? Recorded. It's recorded. Um, so, oh, uh, by it, the way, for the ethics, that was a joke. I'm not actually going to take anything. <laughs> that, was a, yeah, that was a math joke. So, um, and I can prove it. <laughs> um, anyhow, uh, so again, uh, kudos to to the agencies, to everybody here, but everybody's involved in, in this. It's a it's a major major task. 
I very much appreciate everyone taking this on, all the work they've put into it, and uh, also really engaging and using this to um, have a series of important conversations. And I think this really moves the, the ball forward. Obviously the next step are actual, actual revisions, but it's a privilege to be a part of the antitrust version of Taylor Swift era's tour, um, be on the all time hits of, of antitrust tours, I think ever. So real quick, um, I again, sort of reiterate, make clear and explicit what the objectives, the focus, foci are, behind these things and the justifications. I think that's very important. Uh, consider maybe whether you can talk about some things that will get quick looks and what those quick looks will would look like. I think coming back to some of Dom's points, which are, are very important, it's important not just to make clear what is going to raise the antennae of the agencies, but what things won't. So uh, on that, I think, uh, thanks, and I uh, very much appreciate having the opportunity to be a part of this. Thank you, Marty. Yeah. Just a couple comments that will repeat and extend from some of what Dom has said, my prior remarks. They're not about the particular provisions. I think all things equal and even all things not equal will do best when they embrace what I sometimes call the common sense paradigm, like why is it right? And it relates to Marty's comment about like what counts as economics. You can get all into the weeds of a merger simulation, but for unilateral effects, what we're talking about like is one of the parties or both gonna raise the price of a product because they're no longer worried about the business losing to the other because losing to themselves. The core economic ideas are mostly common sensible and straightforward. I think by more and more, than these, guide, these drafts do or the prior guidelines did, speaking clearly and directly. This is what we're talking about. This is the effect we care about. This is the basic reason why this is a problem. This tells us what evidence we look at. This tells us how we would use the evidence. I think by making it all more direct and clear, there will ambigu ambiguities will be more often resolved the way you would like them to be resolved. They will provide clear guidance to clients they will be more useful in court, more useful internally. And if you get to something that's hard and people disagree about, it's a little harder to fudge it. And I'm actually against fudging it. Like let's actually state our decision or if there's two competing effects and it will depend, state that there are two competing effects and it will depend. So I'd say when in doubt, but one should never be in doubt. Just like straightforward, clear, direct, do the ABC method. And I think that that will create substantial improvements in a lot of ways. And again, not this particular draft, but really all of that, which has been put out over the decades. Thank you. Tom, I think we have about 30 seconds. If you can. Uh, agree. I, I have a lot of respect for the folks who put this together because it's an incredibly difficult job to find consensus on all these issues. It's really hard, but I think it's really important because the level of consensus is really gonna drive whether courts accept this or not. And so I think you gotta look at all the comments and you have to look at all of the things that we've discussed. I think you have to think hard about, and you're never gonna have full, complete consensus on anything, but what are the things where you're really lacking consensus and does it make sense to include them? Because if you include them, it will influence how courts think about other things in the document. And so I think it's something you need to think about hard. Well, thank you. Uh, I think on behalf of both the FTC and DOJ, I'd really like to thank you for taking the time. I know you're all very busy. Uh, this has been extremely helpful. Thank you very much. All right, everyone. Well, welcome back to the second panel of this um, lovely conference. I also want to thank um, MIT and Harvard for hosting us here. This has been a really, uh, you've put on a great show for us. Um, so I also want to thank everyone on the panel and everyone who's participated on behalf of DOJ and FTC. Um, I just want to reiterate that, you know, as drafters, um, you know, we, we do feel that we are stewards of this process. Um, I'm Susan Athey. I'm the chief economist at the DOJ Antitrust Division, and I'm on leave from Stanford, where I'm an, an economics professor in the business school. And, you know, as, as part of this process, you know, we have been getting just amazing feedback from so many experts who have volunteered their time to 
you know, I don't know how many documents there are where you get thousands of people to sort of grade your homework and make line edits um, over, and, and, and multiple of those. Um, and so that's that's just been really, really helpful. And, uh, and we are definitely um, listening very carefully to all of these comments. So to kick off, let me um, introduce this really distinguished panel we have here. Um, so to my right, I have Daniel Francis. Daniel is a professor of law at NYU Law School. He's um, previously worked at FTC as senior counsel, associate director for digital markets, and ultimately deputy director. And he also spent 10 years practicing antitrust law with two multinational law firms. And then to his right, we are Hoffman. Um, Eleanor is the chief of the New York Attorney General's Antitrust Bureau. She also taught antitrust courses as an adjunct professor of law at Brooklyn Law School for over a decade. Prior to joining the Office of Attorney General, she was a partner in the firm of Kudart Brothers LLP for 16 years. Um, and to her right, we have Kristen Lamarzi. Kristen is a partner in the Antitrust and Competition Practice Group of Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher. Prior to joining the firm, she served in the US DOJ's Antitrust Division, where she was the Appellate Section Chief and a two-time recipient of the US Attorney General's Distinguished Service Award. And finally, we have Mark Reisman. Mark is a professor of economics and chair at Boston University. And his research focuses on network effects, two-sided markets, standardization, and compatibility. Um, he's the former editor of the Rand Journal of Economics and president of the Industrial Organization Society. So so much everyone from be, for being here. This is a truly um, outstanding panel. So we really appreciate your comments. So this panel is focusing on platform competition and a lot of the issues around, around that. And for those of you who haven't been you know, digging in deeply to these draft guidelines, I'll just kind of give a little bit of a table setting. So the way these draft guidelines are structured is they start out by delineating sort of core theories of harm about horizontal and non-horizontal mergers and also theories like potential competition. Um, then there's some guidelines that, that are, are sort of applications that might touch on multiple concepts at the same time. And one more day platforms is like that. It's going to, you know, thinking about mergers involving platforms, they may be horizontal, they may be non-horizontal, um, they may involve, um, buying a, a, a product that rivals use to compete, something like data um, and a raising, raising rivals cost theory. We also often have a lot of concentration in platform markets. So we might have a, a dominant firm um, acquiring either a nascent competitor or an adjacent product. And so we're gonna be pulling together um, theories of harm from, from multiple guidelines. Now, one of the motivations for updating the guidelines altogether is that we need to match the agency's learning as well as trends in the economy. So one reason I think that these platform guideline was important is that although the theories are familiar and the basic economics are familiar, platforms are complicated. Um, and at some level, we, we might not have have thought in the abstract, you know, 50 years ago to write down economic theory or do empirical work or, you know, think about legal scholarship around something that, that wasn't, you know, that common to encounter. While well, today in the economy, we're seeing, you know, the platforms touching every part of our lives. They are touching most businesses in some way or another. And they're, and thus, you know, even small competitive harms in platform markets can have a really large effect on the economy. Because of that, they've gotten a lot of attention. We've seen lots of merger activity. Um, we've seen uh, lots of economic studies, the theory, the empirical work has, and the agency experience and the court's experience have all been catching up. So this guideline is, is sort of intended to, to bring the modern tools um, to bear on this, this fact pattern, which has become increasingly important. So as we, as I mentioned, there's going to be multiple theories of harm that can, that can relate to platform mergers, mergers involving platforms. So I, I thought we would kick off by talking about horizontal theories of harm. So this might be a, a, a one platform buying another platform. This could also involve a 
a platform buying something that might be a nascent competitive threat to the platform. Um, and so we, we also, the guideline also discusses some special considerations about how entry occurs in platforms. And the additionally calls out that there might be, because it's competition is so challenging in these markets, there might be specific moments in time where it's important to protect competition, for example, during technology shifts. So let me start out with Mark. Um, and Mark, I'd love to just get your general perspective of how guideline 10 fits into your understanding about how entry works and platforms. And for example, you know, how, how do you think we need to address the special issues and platforms around how entry works, how difficult it is, for example, buying niche competitors or firms that only compete on one side of the market? Yeah, great. Thanks. Well, first of all, I really appreciate being here and being included with this group and on this distinguished panel. Uh, I think generally, you know, and actually to start with, I was really delighted to see Guideline 10 and this acknowledgement that platforms are uh, a really important area for antitrust to think about and particularly mergers. And I thought the inclusion of, of uh, something along these lines was uh, really welcome. Um, the guideline um, just to try to answer some of the specific points you made, the guideline has this taxonomy of uh, competition between platforms, competition on the platform, like among the firms that might be sellers on the platform, and then displacement. So some new technology or other product that's coming to kind of push the, an existing platform out of the way. I thought that was really helpful and consistent with my sense of the ec economic literature. I guess I would say the displacement language was in some ways almost too strong. And as I think of, I connote with displacement something about a winner take all situation. And there's often, we could have sort of ongoing healthy competition between platforms and, and non-platforms. If you think of like direct to consumer uh, products competing with uh, maybe a more platform set up like Amazon. Um, and so uh, maybe, clarifying that displacement doesn't literally mean at the end of this, one of them is gonna disappear and the other one will be the, the victor, I, I think might be helpful. Um, the guideline goes on to talk about the items that Susan mentioned, um, buying a, a small platform, buying a, a firm that's maybe on only one side of the market. I think those are really helpful uh, and important examples to think about. Uh, when we think about a nascent uh, competitor, actually, I, I would strengthen the language there. The language is something like uh, a platform that systematically purchases small rival networks. We're going to try and stop that in its incipiency. And that, and, and to me, uh, we don't need a sequence of mergers there. Even just one could be really problematic. Even the firm is not systematically buying up rival networks. Even buying one that could somehow turn into a a uh, significant rival could be problematic. And also the intimacy language there, I think can be thought of as to mean, you know, we have to see a sequence of mergers. And I like the language around the nascent competition section better, which kind of makes it seem like if this one firm has the chance of turning into a, a rival, that could be problematic on its own. Um, I could keep going, but I've, why don't I let someone else speak, so. Great, thanks so much. And so Eleanor, you know, you've seen um, as a, lots of this with, from your perspective as an enforcer, do you think that guideline 10 provides the specific guidance that parties can follow when encountering platforms in the merger review process? Uh, thank you, Susan. Uh, first of all, disclaimer, the views that I express here today are my own only and shouldn't be taken as representing the views of the Attorney General of the state of New York or any of any person in our office. I, I wanna thank you for inviting me here today. Um, I think that the guidelines, the draft guidelines, are an important effort to give us all insight into the questions that the agencies are asking and how they assess risk. And from the state standpoint, and full disclosure, New York uh, and California co-led a group of the 23 states that submitted comments on these guidelines. Um, from the state standpoint, we work really closely with the federal agencies and we work on mergers together with the federal agencies very often, as well as do our own merger analysis if something is limited to, let's say, New York. Um, 
and we are very much aligned with the federal agencies in our thinking about mergers and the questions we ask. Sometimes we don't come to the same conclusions. And uh, the T-Mobile Sprint litigation was an example of that. I'll get back to that in a bit. Uh, but we, we do ask the same questions we use. We tend to use the same modes of analysis and the 2010 guidelines were very, very important and the various iterations after 2010, 2020 were very, very important to our analysis. So I think as Susan mentioned before, guideline 10 is the application of, a, of principles in the other guidelines to a particular type of market, a platform market. And it's a market we don't know, or a segment of the economy that we don't know a whole lot about. And I think this is evident, or we haven't litigated much about it. So the guidelines uh, notably cite lots of cases throughout. There's exactly one case citation in guideline 10, that's to the Amex case, because we have not addressed this in a court these kinds of platforms at an appellate level anyway, um, enough to have a body of law that we can talk about. So I think the, the structure of guideline 10 is very useful, dividing it into competition between platforms, on platforms, and to displace platforms. And it's a framework that kind of captures the particular kinds of conduct that the platform environment can nurture. So in some senses, I don't think we're dealing with analyses that are unique to platforms. We can take certainly take lessons that we've learned in other kinds of sectors. But on the other hand, the fact that platforms, I think almost uniquely benefit from network effects and scales, or maybe particularly benefit from network effects and scales, highlights you know, the kinds of concerns that we're gonna be looking at. So one thing guideline 10 does is it has a list of scenarios, A through D, of different kinds of mergers that can impact competition between platforms. The first is pretty easy. It's like run of the mill, you know, one platform acquires another that eliminates competition between the platforms. That's scenario A. But scenarios B through D, I think are pretty much like examples. And I think examples, I'll, I'll repeat something other people have said, could be useful in these guidelines. But B through D, A through D are pretty much examples. And they're pretty clear. So let's say, for example, let's assume for the moment that Facebook and Instagram are independent platforms that compete in the personal social networking markets. Let's just assume that for a minute. If Facebook acquires Instagram now, today, that would be analyzed the same way the T-Mobile Sprint merger was analyzed. We'd ask the same questions. Let's if it's, is there market power? Uh, is there harm to competition? What are the efficiencies? And in that case, we we also had questions about the ability of Sprint to compete as an ongoing force in the market. And we also had questions about the fix proposed by the parties. I think you'd be asking the same questions if Facebook acquired Instagram. The other, and that would be scenario A, but there are other kinds of acquisitions, non-horizontal acquisitions that could impact competition between platforms. And I think that's really the most useful highlight in, in guideline 10. So for example, scenario D is kind of, is, is the situation where let's assume Facebook and Instagram license some unique critical app that instantaneously and automatically improved the resolution of photos that are posted. So Facebook acquired the developer of the app and deprived Instagram of that app. That could be meaningful. It could deprive Instagram of a critical input that Instagram needed to compete or gain scale or gain network effects. That's scenario D. 
Or let's say an online retailer of mobile phones bought Apple. Okay. It could, that's a, a participant on a platform. So it could deprive on other online retailers of a critical participant, right? Uh, and that's scenario C. So I think those kinds of lists of scenarios or which are pretty simple or examples which could be more complicated would be very, very useful. And I think they are very useful in this guideline. Uh, so I think that I should stop there and let other people talk. Great, and so we'll come back in a minute actually to get more on the non-horizontal theories. Um, before we do that, let me actually turn to, to Kristen and Eleanor brought up the network effects and the scale economies. Um, how do you think the guidelines do, Kristen, in terms of providing clarity in cases where, for example, two smaller platforms might merge in order to get network effects, or maybe a leading platform wants to buy a smaller platform or a more specialized platform and sort of invoked network effects or efficiencies. How, how do you think the guidelines do in sort of helping delineate what kinds of mergers would be problematic and which ones would not? Uh, thanks, Susan, and, and thanks for having me. And, and my heart is with everyone working on this project. Guidelines are among the hardest things to do in the agencies, and you have all of my sympathies. Um, taking your first scenario first, the merger of two smaller players to gain network effects. I don't actually really see much in the guidelines that expressly addresses this scenario. The example in A that Eleanor was pointing to is this is the second one you mentioned, right? The sort of dominant platform acquiring a smaller player. But I think if you, what the guidelines do say that's relevant to that scenario seems to be three things. First, network effects can create a tendency towards concentration in platform industries. That's in guideline 10. Mergers shouldn't fur further a trend towards concentration. That's in guideline eight. And then efficiencies. And here, I think it's fair to call network effects gained in a merger of two smaller platforms a, a type of efficiency. Efficiencies are not cognizable if they were accelerate a trend toward concentration. So taken together, I read that as sort of expressing a broad hostility to uh, horizontal platform mergers, regardless of the size of the players. Um, I think that's misguided because of course, the value of platforms to consumers can increase dramatically based on as a network expands, even when the expansion comes in the context of a merger. Um, not to mention that amassing sufficient scale and network effects by merging smaller platforms might put that smaller, those smaller platforms in a position to challenge a dominant platform. Um, this is perhaps a species of a larger concern I have with the guidelines that I know has been discussed in prior workshops, which is that there's, and maybe this is unintended, a, an emphasis on concentration over competition in a way that I think is maybe creating some uh, miscommunications around this. And so I hope some of that's gonna be cleaned up in the revisions. The second example is the one outlined in guideline 10, right? Which is the dominant player of dominant platform lessens competition entrench their position by systematically acquiring platforms when they're in their infancy. Um, I don't think this tells you very much about what makes that acquisition problematic, particularly in the context of, of network effects. Um, and it, in particular, I think taken at face value, it seems to me both over and under inclusive. Over-inclusive in the sense that it doesn't account for the benefits that platforms provide through network effects and that there is real, real strength in scale in a platform in a way that there might not other, otherwise be um, in different industries. It doesn't tell the reader anything about those benefits, even if they are cognizable under the efficiency section, how they would be weighed against any potential harm. I think it's under-inclusive in the sense that Mark touched on, which is that it seems to presume that only a series of transactions would actually create this problem, right? You can conceive of a single acquisition that harms competition, even if it falls short of a systematic acquisition of platforms in their infancy. Um, so overall, I, I have concerns that there's, there's not good information about, other than broadly saying network effects can increase concentration, and a general hostility to concentration, you're left with the impression that, um, that there's not a countervailing balance here that I think is real and is reflected in the cases, but also sound economics. So, 
Great, thanks. And I, one of the things that you're you're hinting at here is is how you would rebut um, the, any of these theories of harm. Just for those again who haven't like dived into the document, one thing we we often have been highlighting in these workshops because a lot of people have missed it is that you know there is a fairly broad rebuttal which says you know the parties can essentially um, bring up anything that rebuts the substantial lessening of competition, but we've been asking for feedback about sort of how to sharpen that uh, and, and make that more clear guideline by guideline. So I wanna come back to that as a, as a deeper topic. I'm gonna ask others to, to comment on. So sort of hold that, hold that thought. Before we get there, actually just on the, on the basics of the measurement, you know, we're really fortunate to have Mark here because he's one of the pioneers in trying to measure network effects. It's extremely hard to do. It's very, it's hard to do. It's hard to have good enough data to do it. And Mark has been very clever at doing that across multiple industries and in his academic work. So um, I would love to have you give any thoughts you have, Mark, about, you know, what kind of challenges we would face in terms of implementing these guidelines if 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 it turns out that measuring network effects or the diminishing returns to network effects becomes an important part of, of the analysis. Well, that was so kind of you, thank you. Um, yeah, so measuring network effects is, is a challenge and it can be really data intensive. I think about this measurement issue from two perspectives. One is what we want to measure. So, um, for instance, the merger guidelines has a section on SNP. It has this section on platforms, but there is an economic literature on how SNP needs to be adjusted in the context of platforms that you know, isn't referenced in the guidelines. Or you know, I could imagine a line saying like, oh, we need to make some of these things are gonna need to be adjusted or measuring harm or uh, whatever it's gonna be. Those things might need adjustment in the context of a platform or these kind of efficiencies on the other side. Um, for sure, you know, there's a, a, a literature on, uh, you know, there's, there's challenges in, in measuring network, network effects and getting all of the data right and, and setting up the, let's say, econometrics, if that's your approach. I would say that sometimes economics makes it easier, not just harder. And, uh, you know, just as an example, if we're thinking of like a platform of sellers, if we know something about the demand curve that the, that the sellers face, you know, we know how the consumers trade off between the firms. We've already learned a lot about how more sellers are, are going to benefit consumers. And, uh, you know, so sometimes we hear, oh, it's so hard to do, measure the, the benefits in a, in a platform market because we need to know how consumers respond to price and how sellers respond to platform prices and how consumers respond to more sellers and how sellers respond to more consumers. And there's so many inputs, but economics can simplify to that in the sense that, you know, once we know this demand curve that consumers have, you know, the sellers are attracted to profit. Now we know a lot about the profit function. More consumers are going to, you know, benefit sellers through profits. We can maybe specify that and, and capture this whole process uh, without so many different uh, inputs um, driving the problem. And so I'm hopeful there's going to be, you know, some, some paths forward uh, in this process. There is a complication in the law, which is that it's often up to the, the, the defense to establish the efficiencies. And they're, so they're the ones that have to measure the, the, the kind of benefits of the network effect. Obviously, the merger guidelines need to kind of acknowledge this problem for the, for the defense and make sure that we have a sort of a fair process uh, go, going forward, but it is in some sense like unequal exactly who's bearing this cost. Yeah, that's right. And I think that depending on the theory of harm, it, it could be an important part of, of the government's case or of the merging parties case, because as we'll come to, some of the theories of harm have to do with, say, creating frictions for multi-homing, in which case the network effects would be an important part of showing how that's going to harm competition. So you're right that that can fall on either either set of parties, um, depending on the setting. Yeah, but the DOJ has to make, or the FTC has to make the, to bring the case, thinking ahead about whether these efficiencies really matter, not just about whether they're going to you know, derail things in court. That's absolutely right. And I think that's another important point in thinking about the guidelines, they're they're kind of written in terms of the harms, but that's but anytime agencies are investigating 
a case, they're also going to be thinking about the rebuttals and they're going to be looking at it holistically. Um, so the burden part comes later when you're when you're thinking about litigation. Well, so Dan, um, do you think, just stepping back, you we heard a lot of different comments about this. Do you think separate guide, guidance is even needed in horizontal mergers involving platforms? Or, you know, this guideline overlaps with the, the first four guidelines, which are all theories of horizontal competition. Um, you know, what what is it that's special here? Um, and do we need special treatment for platforms at all? Uh, what a wonderful question. Uh, and let me just echo what others have said. Huge thank you to our hosts. I think this process, the sort of inclusivity of it and the engagement from the agencies has been incredible. And I'm grateful to be a part of it. Uh, do we need something special for platforms? Uh, maybe, but no more special than for any other kind of business. I mean, it's kind of antitrust first commandment, right? That we take every market and business as it is, as we find it, reflecting the things that make it work. Um, and that's about as far as we need to go, I think. I'm a sort of platform non-exceptionalist in most ways. Uh, so I think, you know, there's modest room to be somewhat helpful. And I think guideline 10 contains a bunch of useful explanation of how to think about some aspects of a platform business. If only because that comes up from time to time and courts sometimes get it wrong. I'm thinking of Sabre Fair Logics. I'd also think of Amex, which I think is a disaster, but I don't think that problem can be solved within these guidelines. So let's maybe set that aside. Um, but I'm not so sure it's totally novel. I think antitrust courts have been confronting platform cases, you know, perhaps not frequently, but for a long time. Microsoft is a pretty complicated story of platform competition being harmed, including some compliment foreclosure. Court did a pretty good job. Uh, before that, Lorraine Journal is a story of, you know, customer foreclosure with a two-sided platform. Court did a pretty good job. So there's some of that stuff in guideline 10. I think it's helpful. If it were me, I would be a little clearer about trying to solve the Sabre Fair Logics problem. I would say explicitly and upfront, a multi-sided business can compete with single-sided businesses, just leave no room for confusion. I also think it's fine to talk about network effects, although I think that's not necessarily a platform problem, right? Fax machines have network effects. Pickleball sets have network effects, arguably. Um, other guidelines, not so much 10, but other guidelines read with some of this stuff might suggest that network effects alone are a problem. I want to echo what Kristen said about guideline eight on trends. That sort of sets my hair on fire. Overlaps with guideline seven in a way that I know we'll talk about later, as well as the trend exception to efficiencies. So network effects, you know, are complicated. They don't always favor an incumbent monopolist, right? Sometimes the consequences or the shape of a scale curve is really complicated. And at certain levels of scale, you get congestion effects and the presence of differentiation really complicates the story. So where does that leave me? Sort of thinking that it's really important to be attentive to the ways in which specific markets or platforms or businesses work in platforms as in other markets. And I wanna agree with Eleanor the guideline tell, 10 is best understood as just being an application of guidelines two to five traditional horizontal and vertical theories to some platform businesses. The concern I have, setting aside the conflict of interest stuff, is that a lot of the music of guideline 10 suggests that there might be special theories of harm in the platform context or special presumptions of harm in the platform context. And I think that's really wrong. And I think letting that idea take hold would be really dangerous and costly in a lot of ways. It's easy to solve, just kind of underscore Eleanor's observation and say, hey, look, guideline 10 is doing what we might do more elsewhere in the guidelines, giving examples of how guidelines two through five might apply in platform businesses. I think that solves most of my problem. If you lash it to a you know, welfare harm metric as well, it probably solves all my problems if we take out the conflict of interest stuff. But in general, I think there's a lot of stuff to really value in guideline 10. I just cabin it a little more sharply. Great. Thanks so much. And I think that is the way that you described it as sort of an application is, is kind of the way that we've been describing it. But I agree that it can be a little bit confusing um, how that is. And there's we're not going to talk about it today, but the 
labor market guideline also has the same flavor. It's it's sort of it's like an example of how these other theories are applied in a specific context. And these are the two contexts that we kind of two contexts where we've elevated it as like kind of very extended examples where interlocking theories may take place. So Eleanor, um, earlier you you already sort of started talking about non-horizontal theories. Um, so you may have already covered, but in case you have more to add, I wanted to see if you had any reactions just to the general way that we framed the raising rivals cost and incentivability arguments, which is in guideline five. Um, did you have more to say on that? Uh no, but I actually have more to say on guideline six. Okay, uh, <laughs> go for it. So guideline so, six for those who, again, who aren't memorizing the numbers um, is, is it, it, it's also a, a non-horizontal theory, but there's a structural presumption on the, the monopolization of the input market. Yeah, so I wanna, first of all, make very sure that we understand what a presumption does. A presumption shifts burdens of proof and it is, I think unabashedly kind of a tool that helps both courts and enforcement agencies or plaintiffs. Um, and what guideline six does is it creates a presumption in vertical mergers that supplements or gives enforcement agencies and perhaps courts eventually another way of approaching a vertical merger beyond the incentive and ability <coughs> test in guideline five. Now, from where I sit as an enforcer, this is helpful to me. I won't, I'm not going to comment on whether the presumption should be 50% or 30% or 60%. Uh, I don't really know. Um, it's something maybe that a retrospective on vertical mergers could help us figure out. But so here's my, my issue. Incentive and ability is a very very hard test for an enforcement agency. According to guideline five, that's the way you show your prima facie case, you make out your prima facie case. But this is what happens in the courtroom. We as plaintiffs come in with experts, highly qualified economists who can testify based on theory and reliable methodology and recognized methodology that the firms post-merger will have the incentive and ability to foreclose something, an input usually, uh, that will impact their rival, the merge firm's rival. This, so the economists will get by a Dalbert motion as long as they are using reliable methodology and recognized methodology and are credible and all of that. But then the defendants come in and they come in with very highly qualified, knowledgeable, credible executives who can say, I've worked in this business for 40 years or 20 years. I know this market inside out. We have no incentive whatsoever to deprive our rival of an input. And that's for a couple of reasons. It'll hurt our reputation. It will diminish the profits of the division or subsidiary that we've just acquired. That, well, that may be true, but an, an executive, a CEO is gonna worry about the profits of the firm, not one division. So if you hurt division B, but you make much more money in division A, uh, that's what the, the CEO is gonna care about. And then who is the judge gonna believe? They may be impressed by the economists, but that's economic theory. And then they've got factual evidence on the other side. So given the choice between theory and fact, and I think this is kind of like what the 1992 Kodak case says, we choose fact over theory. And that, that's the problem for an enforcement agency. So I think what guideline six does, it establishes a, pri a a presumption that will enable an enforcement agency or maybe an eventual, eventually a court will think about it this way to shift the burden to the defendants to prove, to prove lack of incentive or ability to actually foreclose a rival. And I think that 
um, again, from where I sit, that would be important. I wanna go back to the 30% or 50%, it's a 50% presumption. Um, I think, I don't have an opinion on what the, the correct number should be, the correct percentage should be. I do think, and there, there has been talk about this, that retrospectives on past mer vertical mergers could be very, very helpful here in figuring that out. Great, thanks so much. Well, so this is sort of a pessimistic view you've given on non-horizontal mergers. So there's another theory of harm um, in the guidelines, which possibly could be in another legal framework, which could be used to address that challenge, which also would often apply in platform mergers, and that's the entrenchment theory. So guideline seven, um, introduces to the guidelines something that wasn't emphasized in, in 2010, which is that in, indeed a merger might be used to entrench a, a dominant firm's position. Now there's some a few things about this guideline. We've asked for a lot of input about exactly how do you define a powerful firm or a dominant firm. The way it's written in the draft guidelines is 30% is a, is a cutoff, but then it goes on something that a lot of readers have missed is it goes on to then discuss a sliding scale so that, you know, the greater the dominance and the, the greater the power, you know, the, the, the bigger the concern, but the 30% number seems to have captured a lot of, of attention. So that's something that we're, we're thinking about, but beyond that, um, you know, it, there's a, a legal framework around entrenchment, which is a bit different than the incentive ability framework. So, um, Daniel, you recently wrote an article called Making Sense of Monopolization, uh, which goes through a lot of the challenges in, in doing monopolization type cases. So I'm curious if you could give us your reactions. Um, you know, we've got we've got the, the Sherman Act, we've got the Clayton Act, um, we've got some some theories in, in guideline seven. What are your reactions? How do these things differ? And assuming that this legal framework might be helpful based on Eleanor's comments. Um, how would you rewrite it? Gosh, and you're generous to mention uh, mention the making sense piece. For sure, guideline seven and the problem of entrenchment of monopoly power is, is close to my heart. I, I, I have a lot of room in my heart for a section two and the problem of, of tech monopoly and other forms of monopoly power. Uh, Maybe strangely then, I don't think these guidelines should say anything about section two. And, and currently I think it's a little odd that we have kind of 40 pages about section seven and like one paragraph about section two. That's partly because I have a slightly quixotic view of what section two does, ways in which it's prophylactic in certain ways. Um, for those who are interested, making sense of monopolization available in all good copies of the antitrust law journal near you. Um, and I think doing justice to how section two works would require pretty lengthy treatment in ways that overlap with, but aren't identical to section seven. So I would either lean in all the way and have a section of these guidelines that talks about section two or take it out and keep the document focused on section seven. So with that in mind, let's just talk about guideline seven, this entrenchment or extension of dominance. The biggest headline problem I have with seven is that it goes out of its way, as I read it, to wink at an efficiency offense, but doesn't provide a criterion or principle that we could use to exclude it. So I take the core theory of seven to be, there's this kind of special and undefined way, separate and apart from guidelines two through five, which are our traditional horizontal and vertical theories, in which a merger can violate section seven if a dominant company is involved. But as I read it, everything that guideline seven could be talking about falls into one of three buckets. It's either a horizontal story that fits within guidelines two through four, a vertical story that fits within five. I do not have room in my heart for guideline six for ways maybe we could talk about later, or it's an efficiency. And those first two buckets are already covered in these guidelines. So we don't need to say anything else about them. And that third guide, that third bucket efficiencies shouldn't be winked at. And like this, this is shot through guideline seven. So I know that the draft pays some lip service to the idea that it's not concerned with, not trying to punish pure efficiencies, 
but the kind of things that it talk that it's talking about not very clearly in that direction. Scale economies, network effects, raising the level of time, money, and expertise to develop a competing product, depriving rivals of access to scale economies and network effects. So I take the core puzzle of section two that we've been wrestling with for 130 years to be the recognition that there are good ways and bad ways to entrench monopoly power and you need some principle for distinguishing between them. Welfare effects is a really good way to do that, right? So, and I've taken that to be consistent with section seven. If even a dominant company lowers its cost, that's the only effect of a merger. And as a result, that position of dominance is increased. That's a good merger, not a bad merger. Not just because the economic welfare effects are beneficial, but because the Supreme Court said so in Cargill. I don't think there's any room for doubt that that cannot be a theory of harm. And yet guideline seven seems to imply the contrary. So what would I do? I would take guideline seven out. I would make sure two through five are razor sharp. And that's where I would leave it. If you really, really, really wanted a special rule for dominant firms, I would key it to monopoly power. And I would say a horizontal acquisition by a monopolist is presumptively anti-competitive. Like that deal is going to blow the HHI thresholds anyway, right? 70% market share, you're looking at HHIs in the 5,000s. Sounds kind of radical. I don't think it is. But I wouldn't do anything in the direction of current guideline seven, recognizing that that may be a marginal view. Excellent. Okay. Um, well, so this has obviously been something that's gotten a lot of feedback on different sides. So, um, so I'm sure we're going to be continuing to to discuss this. And I think the the platforms is definitely a case where a lot of these forces start colliding because, again, we do have platforms that have more than 50% share um, in the economy, sure. and you know they are sometimes buying adjacent firms that are not horizontal. Yeah. Um, and we, we, I think, need to think about how we're going to deal with those, um, especially in the context of what um, Eleanor described is a really challenging environment for this kind of foreclosure. If we think about applying this raising rivals cost theory to platforms, you know, it can be applied in a few different ways. Um, a platform might acquire a source of data or a platform might acquire a distribution source. Um, and then or they might acquire you know, one of these things and make them exclusive. It could acquire an important buyer or an important seller and make them exclusive. And those can all be forms of foreclosure that, again, they in principle fall under the, the, the guideline five on raising rivals costs. One argument about thinking about it from an entrenchment perspective is that when you start from when you start your, your analysis from the perspective of a dominant firm, there, okay, there probably are some barriers to entry here. And so by, by starting the analysis, by thinking about what are the barriers to entry and how the merger interacts with those barriers to entry, it's a slightly different frame than just the starting with the incentive ability framework. Mark, I'm, I, I'd like to, to turn to you and ask, you know, what kinds of challenges would you expect could arise if you were analyzing a merger's potential to entrench monopoly power um, in, in one of these ways, um, for example, buying a source of data? And what kinds of evidence do you think would be important for, for establishing this type of theory? Yeah, it's really challenging. I, I think um, clarifying the difference between entrenchment and, and raising rival cost is really helpful. And I, I feel like the guidelines have something in mind that the, you know, the kind of effect on price or the immediate, the way we would think with the raising rival cost, but we're kind of creating a firm that's so big that it's going to somehow be very hard for future entrants that that maybe aren't here yet to kind of enter or, or compete with them. I mean, to the extent the things that you're describing are, are a form of vertical merger, like I'm buying that data set or that input, then we face all the problems that we've talked about in the context of a vertical merger. There's going to be efficiencies uh, uh, that that benefit the, the platform um, to the extent the platform is leveraging, let's say that data set across many, many consumers, maybe they, 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 the efficiencies could be, could be large. Um, 
the uh, if we want to argue that this is, is is keeping rivals out, then we have to ask: Was there some other way that this potential rival could have been able to obtain the same information? And those are really complicated questions. When you talk about measurement, I feel like part of the challenge for the economist is is um, you know similar to how we talk about nascent competition. We're often talking about markets that are hypothetical or don't don't exist yet. You know, I think of like. Um, Comcast Time Warner, which I'm not sure that fits as a uh, entrenchment case, but it's a big part of the theory of harm was about over the top video, which now is is a big thing, but is at the time was you know sort of almost imaginary. Um, and you know economists aren't futurists, and it's hard to do econometrics on industries that don't exist yet, and that's very challenging. And I would just echo what Marty said that part of economic analysis is relying on uh, course of business documents, industry testimony, you know, industry facts and, and these kind of observations it doesn't all have to be, you know, statistical work. And yeah, and some, sometimes face the question, well, do you do that in your own research, published research? And of course the answer is absolutely yes. I mean, every, every paper I, every paper I write or every IO or industrial organization economist that I know is, is taking a really hard look at the industry and, and interviewing people and and using that as guidance into how they they set up their model or set up their their research. So you know, I think the evidence is going to be maybe broader than what you normally think of the economist to focus on. Yeah, and I think you raised a couple of interesting points. So actually, in terms of like you know barriers to entry, well, to start with, you know, one one of course you can apply guideline five and raising rivals costs to barriers to entry. But in some cases, you know, you might have a platform that has such large share that it's a little bit hard to even know exactly what that entry would look like. And so therefore to do the math on what foreclosure would look like might be difficult. And so the, the I guess the economic frame of creating barriers to entry is, is perhaps a little bit more flexible in that way than doing vertical math, um, which sort of requires a little bit more specificity about the way that competition is working. Um, another thing you raised actually is interesting about, so when AT&T and Time Warner merged, I was an expert on, on that case on efficiencies and um, for the DOJ. And But one of the party's claims was that their merger was actually going to help them like sort of overcome a chicken and egg problem. Not many people even remember this, um, but because uh, it didn't get a lot of coverage, but what, what they actually claimed was that they were going to start a new ad platform that was going to compete with Google DoubleClick's ad platform. That was their efficiency. And by putting together their data and their assets, that was what was going to overcome the chicken and egg problem to create a new ad platform. Now, going back to like, you know, how these efficiencies work out in practice, <laughs> that didn't happen, obviously. So I guess as I feel vindicated as the efficiencies expert that said that that wasn't going to happen. But, um, but you know, they, it, this is actually some of the theories in this guideline could be used by the merging parties as well. Um, we've, we, the, the guideline has sort of articulated what some of the challenges that are to overcome uh, the entry barriers that are, that are sort of intrinsic with, um, with platforms. Yeah, the defense is often also making these speculation about what's going to happen down the road. And, and that's, it's hard for economists or judges to make those decisions. Yeah. Uh, Again, I want to emphasize the need for retrospectives here. Might be interesting to do some retrospectives on vertical mergers. All consummated merger challenges, right? The one signal win in the vertical case was Steve's and Sons, right? Brought not by the government, but by a private party after consummation because the merging firm, the merged parties had foreclosed. So this may be a place where not just some retrospectives, but some consummated challenges where you can say, look at the foreclosure, it actually happened, could really help enforcement and build some tools that then get used in EHSR case. Well, so that's a very positive view on how antitrust enforcement can work um, after a merger. Um, Eleanor, let me turn back to you maybe for uh, another take on that. Um, so when we think about the issue of, you know, enforcement for merging parties for closing, um, how does this intersect with the antitrust laws existing um, take on refusals to deal? Um. Okay, so refusals to deal is a, 
a conduct problem. Uh, and going back to first principles, um, when we, and I, I'm thinking about this in a, in a monopolization context or tend to create a monopoly context and I'll get back to guideline seven in a minute. Um, so monopolization from a legal standpoint deals with conduct that's intended to and has the effect of excluding or impeding rivals or potential rivals. And as the Microsoft case emphasized, it can exist in a myriad of forms. Like there's no, the, the kind of overriding concept is exclusionary conduct. And Colgate, an old case that has never been overruled, makes clear that a firm has the right to choose its trading partners absent a purpose to create or maintain a monopoly. That language is there. Uh, even though it wasn't quoted in Trinco, that language is there. So refusals to deal is a label that in my view has been applied too broadly to immunize a whole swath of conduct that could be viewed as exclusionary or monopolistic. <laughs> it's, it's been used to almost create this per se rule of legality um, for basically refusing to deal with a rival in a way that could, could entrench or create or maintain a monopoly. So coming back to the entrenchment guideline, this perhaps is a way to deal with that problem in its incipiency. I'm not sure it's the best way. I'd like to see some doctrinal change in the law on refusals to deal that would, you know, take Aspen and take Trinco and, and really understand better what, what those cases were about and what they did. The entrenchment guideline, you know, if, you, if you're looking at a, a situation where you suspect that the merging firm will have the incentive and ability to refuse to deal with its rivals, like refuse to deal with a developer who has an app that, that needs to be on a platform in order to get any traction, um, then maybe the entrenchment guideline is the way to get to it, but I'm not sure it's the best way. Another kind of scenario that I, I think would fit into the entrenchment guideline is a situation where a firm acquires an important set of data or a compilation of data and then deprives a rival of that data or degrades the data or delays transmission of the data in a way that harms a rival. Um, one thing that the entrenchment guideline gets at is it highlights to me anyway that foreclosure need not be complete. It can be partial in the sense of degrading the quality of whatever the product or services that's being foreclosed. So I'm kind of on the fence on the entrenchment guideline. I think it has aspects of a lot of other guidelines. Um, as Daniel said, maybe sharpening some of the other guidelines. And I think he and I do feel differently about guideline six, but we won't go there. Um, I think that may be one other way of getting at some of these problems, but I do see the relationship between entrenchment and refusals to deal. I guess if, if we merger, that may be our, our last stop on, um, on preventing refusals to deal, I guess, in the current regimes. So, um, um, another topic in guideline 10, so it talked about competition between platforms, competition on the platform. So competition on the platform, that is emerge harm, say competition between the firms that sell on the platform. So guideline 10 discusses the case where say a platform operator buys a platform participant. It describes scenarios where the platform might steer customers to the platform participant. And for example, if there are scale economies, that steering in the short run could have long run impacts. It could create dominance both on the platform and potentially off the platform. Um, so short term steering could have long term impact in those with the with those scale economies. Um, and then it also describes a second theory there where the platform might withhold that now dominant 
participant from competing platforms, which would create uh, problems with horizontal competition um, and could create a bit of a death spiral for the other platform if, if it can't get access to this key participant. So I guess broadly, um, Daniel, you already forecast, you had thoughts and feelings about conflict of interest. So wait, maybe I'll let you kick off and then turn to Kristen from there. Uh, I do, for sure. Uh, let me just say a couple sentences about that, the colloquy we just had about seven and six. And really quickly, I think every every story we've heard today in these wonderfully rich conversations about the vertical concerns that we're trying to capture are foreclosure conversations. If someone's cutting off or delaying access to data that matters as an important input, that is classic input foreclosure. Someone's engaging in tying and bundling because they have the improved ability or incentive to do that in a way that harms competition, that is a foreclosure story. It might be input foreclosure, customer foreclosure, complement foreclosure, whatever it is. So guideline five is the way, I think, for all the stories that we're hearing about. Courts don't always get it right, and in some signal cases, they've got it wrong. But just because we're losing some cases with the right theory, I would not say let's find a theory that makes the story look simpler because I don't think that's going to stick. It's not going to stick economically. It's not going to stick legally because the courts have told us time and again there are no shortcuts in vertical cases. I really think guideline five is the way and six and seven are not. Um, conflict of interest real quick. So conflict of interest, I think, is not an antitrust concept. Originally, it's a sort of fiduciary idea where we're suspicious or concerned that whoever it is is subject to this special obligation might be acting in their own interest. Obviously, inappropriate fiduciary for a fiduciary. Antitrust isn't just comfortable with businesses profit maximizing. It depends on it. It's the whole heuristic that structures every merger analysis we do. There's a flavor of that sometimes in classic vertical merger analysis in what I'm going to call a guideline five kind of way, because we ask whether the merged firm would have the incentive as well as the ability to engage in the conduct that would harm competition. But the idea of a presumptive equal treatment obligation that the conflict of interest language suggests would be totally corrosive to the classic central and routine benefits of vertical integration. I agree those are too often assumed and not proved, particularly in the set of cases that we investigate or litigate, but I don't think anybody thinks that vertical integration as such is usually harmful, and the benefits that it's identified with come exactly from the ability to specially integrate, give special treatment to an integrated division. There have been statutory efforts, including in ICOA, to get this into our law. Those mercifully have failed. I think the last thing we should do is try and retcon it into Section 7 through guidelines. So my instinct is that we would all be doing better without conflict of interest. All right, Kristen? Uh I'm going to agree. I'm very much aligned with Daniel on this. I think, you know, looking at how conflict of interest maps on to the case law, I think the answer is that it, it doesn't. Um, obviously, the literal term conflict of interest has a very specific meaning in various contexts, but none of them antitrust. Um, there are two I think slightly different concepts that this appears close to, although the guidelines don't Guideline 10 does not do a good job of mapping onto either of them. The first is the traditional foreclosure of a, in a vertical transaction, which is discussed at length in guideline five. You know, if a merger substantially lessens competition by giving a firm control over access to a product, service, or customer that its rivals need to complete in a platform context, maybe that's the platform itself, or maybe it's data. Um, that's a problem. That theory is well grounded in the case law. It involves examining the merged entity's ability and incentive to actually weaken or foreclose rivals. Again, well explained in guideline five, very familiar. Guideline 10 doesn't merely apply those concepts, though, to the platform context. It alters it, and maybe unintentionally, because I do think the language in here is confusing, but guideline 10 describes conflict of interest as an attribute of multi-sided platforms. And it goes on to say that a platform operator that is a platform participant has a conflict of interest from its incentive to give its own products and services an advantage, harming competition. 
It's a lot of leaps in that sentence. Um, so by its language, guideline 10 seems to assume away the ability and incentive analysis that's required by the case law and that's acknowledged in guideline five. five. It seems to state that conflicts of interest are inherent in the combination of a platform and a platform participant. And I just don't think there's any basis in law or logic for that. The second concept that's conflict of interest adjacent, I guess, is more of a conduct issue, self-preferencing, right, which has gained prominent traction in the EU and the Google shopping case. But there, of course, the EU started with the finding that Google had a dominant market position, upwards of 90%. And it was on that basis that Google was able to effectively self-preference its comparison shopping service. Guideline 10, unfortunately, doesn't connect up this conflict of interest with any kind of market power analysis. Um, and so, I, and again, I just don't think there's anything in the law or the guideline to justify that. Um, I also think that the, the consequences of this, while guideline 10 seems plainly to be uh, mostly contemplating the sort of traditional antitrust boogeyman of, a, of an online pr platform, sort of a big tech platform. It's not clear to me how the conflict of interest concept described in guideline 10 is different from a grocery store that discounts its store brands, right? Or a streaming service that promotes its original content. Things that I think we do generally assume are not anti-competitive and in some interest instances even pro-consumer. And so I think there's a, a possibility of real collateral consequences here, perhaps unintended, but nevertheless, uh, uh, there's a danger. All right, Mark, what about the, we've been talking a lot about the law and how the different legal frameworks fit in. Um, how do you think about the conflicts of interest from an economics perspective? And how would you assess economically whether this type of you know, preferencing or foreclosure would would be a problem and would have these impacts? Yeah, so first, I just want to acknowledge the tension that I feel between our panel and the previous panel, which is uh, the previous panel seemed to want more. They want more examples, more explanations of when this works. And our panel seems to always want less, like just get, <laughs> get rid of get rid of guideline, which, which whatever, because it's already captured in raising ruffle cost or something. And uh, I want to be with my panel because like, I'm just a team clubby person, but I'm <laughs> not totally sure. Uh, I don't know. I just want to acknowledge the tension without actually taking a position on, on either side. Um, so so the, the way it's the uh, self-preferencing is written is something about, um, you, you know, the, the platform buys, let's say one of the sellers on its platform uh, and then preferences it. And then there's, some kind of scale economies. So I'll say, you know, in, in economics, we don't need the scale economies. Like that can be anti-competitive. The firm could be driven just by um, the, the margins of its of its new newly purchased seller relative to the rivals to, to um, self-preference or, or implement this conflict of interest uh, in a way that's bad for consumers. Scale economies, I think, magnifies that, that issue that, that you're describing. And I would just, just clarify the first thing economists, I think, think of when they hear scale economies is something about cost. But I think here we mean a, a broader statement about scale economies, network effects, uh, information, data, or or something like some something like that. And so, you know, um, there are certainly um, uh, economic tools for for measuring these things: cost side scale economies, measuring network effects, and. Susan keeps giving me the measurement questions, and I'm trying to hold back from talking about you know endogeneity and variables and I'm going to talk you, about you do you mark I know with, with Susan Airfield any way you like any way you like machine learning um so but I'm gonna uh just you know kind of not talk about those things and just just say that I think I think again you know that should always be complemented um with you know really clear story about the industry and grounded in evidence we get from expert industry expert testimony and uh um in, we're always going to look for that kind of course of business documents that can really help us, uh, you know, feel good about uh, that, and perhaps even completely substitute for the kind of you know econometric analysis that we might do, um, or at least complement it in, in a really positive way. But so maybe just higher level, like when do you think this? Kind, you know, so you didn't object to strongly to the conflict of interest theory of harm. 
there clearly are some limits on it. Um, but when do you think it might be a problem? Like what, what are some, you said, you said network like effects weren't necessary, but could you just give an example, even if it involves network effects or not of like where you think that there would be consumer harm from this kind of preferencing? Um, so um, maybe a case where there, there wouldn't be harm, you know, um, Kristen talked about supermarkets and, you know, generally I think we're going to look for some kind of market power or um, in uh, that the platform has. And if, you know, the supermarket we think is um, doesn't have this kind of market power or the streaming platform is, um, you know, it, without taking a position on whether these markets are competitive or not, to the extent that they are competitive, um, they're, you know, I think those concerns will be minimized. And the problem is going to be when the platform has has power and has the ability to, um, you know, benefit itself and create profits from the self-preferencing in a way that, uh, and then uh, ideally we're looking also to be able to say it's bad for consumers. They're not getting the products they want or they're kind of not getting access to the right, right products. So it could be like softening competition between the participants on the platforms to preference one for reasons other than their price or their quality, for example, that would, that would be, that would make the market less competitive for the participants on the platform. Right, and the the kind of losers in the self-preferencing or might be in a kind of increased competitive situation because they need to kind of come up with dramatically lower prices in order to get to, let's say, the top of the search algorithm or, or something like that. Right. So now and we have a situation where consumers are getting served up, you know, one, one product and um, maybe in a world where the search algorithm weighted them equally, they made a, might have made different choices. Right, okay. Great. So we are coming short on time. And gosh, we haven't talked about Amex very much yet. Um, so let me let me try to uh, to bundle together our last two topics, which were really about rebuttals. How would you rebut any of these theories of harm? And particularly in light of of Amex, where um, in some sense, you know, you it, there might be a it, we're going to whether we may have to think about both sides of the market at the same time versus each side separately. So Kristen, do you want to start on that? Sure. Um, so I, I think the treatment of Amex in the guidelines, and I have thoughts about what is said, but I want to preface by saying, I think it really is an example of the larger problem with the approach of including case citations and guidelines, which I know has been talked about a lot, including I think today by the chair. Um, the uh, and, a, and a criticism of the 2010 that they don't include uh, case citations. I think it's a mistake to think the 2010 guidelines are divorced from the case law. I, I worked on those guidelines. My very first assignment was to read every single merger decision from the passage of the Clayton Act till 2010, somewhere in the bowels of DOJ or memo upon memo upon memo about how the courts think about unilateral effects, coordinated effects, potential competition, and critically how they use and sometimes misuse guidelines to address those issues. I think we were keenly aware of the interplay between guidelines and case law at that time, as well as the courts as an audience for guidelines. But the decision not to cite cases was quite intentional because the persuasive power of guidelines depends on their ability to reflect first principles, uh, as sound economic reasoning, truth, I think, or some approximation of it. There will be good decisions and bad decisions. It's, I think, awfully defensive and ultimately unpersuasive to ground guidelines in something as quixotic as the federal courts. I think Amex exemplifies this in particular. The Amex investigation was opened by the Bush administration. It was litigated by the Obama administration. It was pressed in the Supreme Court by the Trump administration. And never in any of that time did the government advocate for something that resembles Justice Thomas's ultimate opinion? So I think it's fair to say there's broad consensus across uh, administrations that the decision is at the very least confused. Footnote 76 is plainly an attempt to cabin the Amex decision and avoid what I think I can comfortably call in this audience the saber fair logics problem that people will understand. Um, but that point that sometimes platforms compete with firms that operate only on one side of the platform is already made in the text. And in truth, it isn't limited to platforms. It's a 
it's a truth generally about the possible uh, effects of mergers. Meanwhile, in trying to cabin the Amex decision, the footnote appears first to concede that the decision is instructive for merger analysis at all, although without explaining why or how. And second, to endorse the statement in Amex that transaction platforms are better understood as supplying only one product, transactions. A concept that I doubt reflects the consensus views of the drafters, and here's where I'm going to try to be careful to not let my Amex PTSD show. After conceding that transaction platforms are treated differently in merger analysis, the footnote doesn't tell you anything about how to differentiate a transaction platform from other types of platforms, or at least nothing more than is already in the Amex decision. To my mind, ultimately how Amex applies in a merger challenge is an issue for litigation. All the footnote does to my mind is cab in the agency's options in that litigation. And I think, and I know you wanted to com combine with rebuttals. So can I say a quick thing about rebuttals at Amex? <laughs> um, I think this is, a, I think there's a real danger in um, uh, how the agencies think about rebuttals in the context of Amex. I start from the lived experience that courts hate when they can't consider some set of facts about a transaction. They really hate not being able to look at the whole picture. And that's why even though Procter & Gamble says you can't, inefficiencies isn't a defense, uh, every single lower court to ever be presented with an efficiencies defense has looked at it. They may not have granted it, but they look at it. The instinct is even stronger in platforms and Amex is an example. It was anathema to the courts at every level that they wouldn't be able to consider the impact of the anti-steering rules on the consumer side. The draft guidelines seem to resist this by trying to narrow Amex in footnote 76. Um, but I think there's a real risk that even if a court is inclined to try to adhere to the idea that out of market efficiencies aren't cognizable, they're gonna to react to that by modifying market definition. I think that's undoubtedly part of what was animating the court's decision in Amex. And I think the consequences of that are far worse than any benefit of saying out of market efficiencies are not recognized. All right, well, so we are almost out of time. So let me give Eleanor the last word and I will not have much concluding remarks as a result. So, um, on Amex, uh, I think footnote 76, which is again, the only um, say, uh, case site in the platform's uh, guideline. I liked it. I liked the way it tried to cabin the Amex decision because I, I joined those on this panel who have said that it is not a, a good decision. I think uh, a number of us have said that. It is harmful. I think it is problematic in the way it shifts burdens of proof on market definition, and it's harmful in a whole lot of ways. So starting from the principle that it's a Supreme Court decision that we have to live with, uh, I wanna cabinet as much as possible. And I think footnote 76 does that. On rebuttals. So when I first saw this, the structure of the guidelines, it made perfect sense to me. This is how you approach a case. You look at your evidence to make out the prima facie case. You look at the evidence of rebuttals, uh, which come after the prima facie case in theory. And then there's a reply, which is mainly how the efficiencies are speculative, not verifiable and lack consumer benefits. Um, but then I began to think about it more. and. I think that it would be helpful to incorporate rebuttal considerations or at least preview rebuttal considerations in the earlier parts of the guidelines. One way this could be done, again, is through the use of scenarios or examples. You could start with something that is relatively simple and then point out how, okay, so uh, the agencies met the presumption of 50%, or if you're looking at another guideline, 30%, or whatever that presumption is, and then explain how uh, a firm would rebut that presumption, at least preview it, maybe not go into it in detail, cross-reference the, the more detailed sections at the end. 
So I think there is room to incorporate some references to rebuttal. The other thing that I was thinking of, and I think um, Kristen alluded to this, is that the guidelines are there not only for litigation, but they're also for, to give people guidance during investigations. When firms come to us and they come to us like they do to DOJ and FTC to make their case about a particular merger, they don't come in saying, well, you know, there's no anti-competitive harm. Half the time they come in and say, well, we understand how you might think there's anti-competitive harm, but here are all the efficiencies that we want to present to you. So it's not neatly packaged in a sequential form. We hear it all at once. Uh, and likewise, trials are not so neatly packaged in sequential forms. There, there is a, a structure, a theoretical, but very often you hear about different parts of the case in different segments of the trial. So uh, I'm in favor of actually uh, talking a little bit more about rebuttal evidence in earlier parts of the guidelines. Great. Well, so I'm, thanks everybody for your patience as we went a few minutes over. Um, I just want to close out by thanking everyone again. You know, we worked so hard and all of the staff spent so much time coming through these, but then as we've opened up to such a wider set of experts, we've again had that same experience we had with going to the staff and getting so much feedback and suggestions and everybody's lived experience with their cases. You know, basically it seems like each case is its own special snowflake that leaves people with passions and PTSD that, you know, you want to, you all, we, I think we all want to write the guidelines around, around each case. And it's that like collective um, wisdom from all of those cases and lived experience that hopefully comes together um, to the best product we can come up with. So thank you again for volunteering your time and thanks for everyone for watching. Thanks. I think we're, we're gonna get this <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ken Merber. Uh, I'm an attorney at the Federal Trade Commission working on the guidelines with Susan and Dave and Aviv. Um, I want to echo everyone's thanks for MIT and Harvard and all of our panelists uh, for joining us and making this a really fantastic event. I think we heard a lot of really uh, thoughtful commentary, both on, on panel one, on what we should add to clarify and explain and on panel two, as Mark pointed out to him, what, what some people might cut um, <laughs> or, or, or uh, otherwise modify. I mean, I think, uh, you know, I, I heard a lot of, of commentary on, on market definition, perhaps not serving a particularly useful function. Certainly that I, we, we all know what Lewis's uh, perspective on that is. Uh, it's, it's, it's very, <laughs> uh, very clear on that point. Um, and at the same time, uh, you know, we also heard that there's, a little bit of ambiguity uh, that, that people have in terms of you know some of the guidelines and and even in some cases I think we heard requests for a, additional clarity on you know the the fundamental question of of what it is we mean by competition um, and obviously this is an entire you know the statute says almost nothing other than that competition is the thing that we are supposed to protect so of course that is a key area that where we're taking that feedback and, and really thinking about it and in terms of that feedback and and moving forward. Uh, I just want to emphasize, you know, as was mentioned at the very top of the program, you know, we received over 3,000 comments on regulations.gov. Uh, we also got tens of thousands of emails uh, <laughs> sent directly to us uh, instead of through regulations.gov, which we are uh, taking a look at as well. And I think that really speaks both to the level of interest that the these issues are presenting in in the United States at the moment, and also to the amount of really careful thought that a lot of people, uh, both experts and also other stakeholders have, have put into to trying to give us their opinions. And we really value that and appreciate it. Uh, and, and we are very carefully thinking through um, how we can address or, or handle all, all of the comments that we've received. So really, I wanna thank everyone uh, for, for commenting, for participating in these discussions to give us a real set of insight into not just how we read what we were writing, but how it's how it's coming across to other other readers, and we think that's a really valuable part of the process. Um, 
going forward, our next event is uh, another set of panels that we have uh, on November 3rd at the University of Chicago. Um, so I would highly recommend tuning into that as well. I'm sure it's going to be another set of interesting discussions. Uh, and thank you all so much for watching.